Welcome back to the City Life Project YouTube channel for yet another picks, predictions, and preview video here for Ryzen 48. And you know, whenever we drop a Ryzen preview show, you know that we're bringing on our boy, the mighty J Wolf, the man, and the only other North American who I think is a bigger Ryzen fan than me. J Wolf, how you doing, buddy? What's up, brother? How you doing? Thank you so much for having me on. I mean, I just. I just look forward to doing these shows with you every single time. I'm just, I was so happy when you hit me up to be on this, on the city life project. Just absolutely. And thank you for actually covering the Epic rise and fighting federation. And just, I mean, we have such a sensational card for you guys this time rising 48 here, all mixed martial art, all superior rule set, mixed martial arts fight, no kickboxing, no bare knuckle, just 11 straight superior rule set mixed martial arts fight. I can, and they're all bangers. It's banger after banger after banger. And I cannot wait to watch this car with y'all. It's going to be so much fun. And it's, you know, it's, it's on Ryzen TV, Ryzen.tv. So we have, it's international access. Uh, Michael Chabello, the voice, is back doing ringside commentary with Damian Brown in Japan. So, you know, you don't have to deal with Zoom commentary anymore. It just... I mean, I, I just I, I cannot wait to to watch these fights with y'all. It's, it's going to be so freaking awesome. I mean, they they took a couple months off here from you know from Super Rise and Three, which was as, as you were saying before that we went on the air. That was that's a card of the year candidate. I think so. Absolutely, hundred percent. And now coming off of that, we get this banger of a card right here with forty eight, just loaded with you know two title fights, hot prospects galore, just international fighters. I mean, just. Man, I cannot wait to, to, for this car. It's going to be so freaking awesome. So and I can't wait to do this show with you. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me on from the bottom of my heart. for Because I, I love this promotion. It's my favorite promotion. You know me. I love the Superior Rule set. I absolutely love it. It's just my favorite. And so I just can't thank you guys enough for, for covering it. Because we don't get anything from the, the quote-unquote mainstream media. They don't even give us a weigh-ins article. So it's like, you know, this this is... This is awesome to be on here and talk with you about it. So, I mean, I, I can go on for hours. You know me. I just, I love this. So let's get into this card. I cannot wait. Oh, absolutely. And no, the, the pleasure is all mine. It's always an honor to bring you on, man, because the the excitement is infectious. And even my community, they love Ryzen, but no one loves Ryzen like you and myself. I will say with this break between Super Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 48, I've really dove into deep I've become a member of their YouTube channel and I've covered every single one of their cards during, you know, the summer pretty much. And it's not quite the same, but you do get to know a lot of these fighters, a lot of these Japanese prospects and a lot of guys and gals from Ryzen who want to get a fight in between cards, go and fight on deep. And there's some superior rule set action, but you know, the two, and I will say the two rounds is a blessing and a curse. Sometimes you want more in the fight, but sometimes when you have like last weekend, 17 fight cards it only takes four hours in deep, which, you know, like I said, blessing and a curse. But uh, you're right. Let's get to this here. Let's start with the first fight on the card here. And what a freaking banger for the first fight on the card here. We have Takaki Kinoshita against Karshiga Doubtbeck. Uh, Kinoshita, 9, 7, and 1 as a pro. 4 and 1 in his last five fights on a three-fight win streak, all in deep. Going up against the absolute stud and wrecking ball out of Kazakhstan. That is Delpec, who's 15 and 3 as a pro. 5 and 0 oh in his last five fights. 13 KOTKOs, one submission, one decision. He's 1 and 1 in Ryzen, but his return in Ryzen, he had an Epic TKO victory in Seki where he almost got the walk off, but not quite. Had to go back and finish the job there in that funny highlight video. And his only other loss in Ryzen was back in 2018 against a prime Mikuru Asakura. Since then, he's been on an absolute tear, beating up guys in a lash pride, ACB, I mean... He's an absolute wrecking ball in this one. Now, Kinoshita is a decent striker as well. Not the best pedigree, not the best record, but he puts on fun fights. Eight KOTKOs, zero submissions, one decision. Um, mostly fights in deep and Shuto. He's zero and one in Ryzen. And his last win, he's coming off his, I believe, first and only decision, which was a split decision. How do you see this one going? Well, 
you know, as you know, Doubtback is one of the hottest prospects in the Epic Rising right now. And I'm, I'm very happy that he didn't get poached by the UFC like another hot prospect. Temurov just got poached by the UFC. I don't know if you saw that. And just, you know, Doubtback is another one of these hot prospects that I was really hoping to stay with Ryzen. And he is still there. And he, as you know, from Drew from the We Are Ryzen podcast, he is very high on Doubtback as well. He wants to see him fast track to a title shot. As, as do I. I mean, the kid is a, a fantastic fighter, as you were saying in your fantastic intro. And just, I mean, I'm really looking forward to this fight. I, I mean, Karate Kinoshida, you know, he's a good fighter, like you said, deep, all that good stuff. But, I mean, Dalbeck is the one to watch here. He, I, I can't wait to see what he does. And they're putting this one to kick off this card because they want to – They want. They, it's, I don't want to say it's like a showcase fight, like it's like a guaranteed win for Dalbeck. But, I mean, he's, he's being put there – to kick this card off in epic fashion and bring the fire right away. So I'm just hoping that he puts on a fantastic performance and that we get a superior rule set finish from him. That, that's what I want to see. Yeah, let's see the soccer kick. I mean, grounded kick. Yes, thank you. Thank you, grounded kick. And remember, for your audience, we call them grounded kicks now because Shingo Kasawagi, the number two uh, guy at, at, at the Epic Rising Fighting Federation, went on the Focus Fights audio podcast with Jay Christian Gary and in an interview with him, told him there is a legalization effort underway right now in the United States. And if we could, since the, the soccer kick is a negative connotation, but a negative perception of like a punting action, right? So he asked us if we could call it grounded kicks instead of soccer kicks to help the legalization effort. That's why, I thank you, Aisha, for bringing that up and saying that right away in the first fight. So I just want to put that out there for everybody to, you know, because we, we want the superior rule set in America. Dude, for those who watch my channel, they roll their eyes because on every stream where I, every every time I commentate fights and see an opportunity where there could be a kick or a knee, I just get so, I rage. I get so <laughs> mad and I go, this is fake MMA, fake <laughs> MMA. It's trash North American rule set here. We need real MMA. And they're all just like, okay, we get it, Isha. You, you're a savage. We get it. But it's true. It's real fighting. She pounded that into their heads, man. They, oh, they need to time. hear it. Every time. The, the UFC's pussified rule set needs to go. I'm so happy that they started the ball rolling with 12 to 6 elbows, which the Epic Rising has had this whole time, I might add. But that's just the first domino, and eventually we're going to get grounded knees. And then after ground knees, we'll get grounded kicks and stomps. And then it'll be the full superior rule set awesomeness. And it's just going to be bliss, absolute bliss when that happens. So that's going to happen within our lifetimes, too. Absolutely. That's going to be awesome. Well, I'm picking Delbeck to win this one as well. He is the minus 800 favorite, 98% on topology. Um, th like I said, 13 KOTKOs. He hits so hard, and he's just so aggressive. But he has that pinpoint accuracy. He he keeps his hands up when it when he does get into a firefight. He's got a really good chin. Can take a shot to give one. And you know, though Karate Kinoshita does have some power as well and does have some good striking, I just don't think it's at the level of Dalbeck. Uh, this will be a stand up fight, which is awesome to open up the show. And I imagine Dalbeck will catch Kinoshita, harder hitter. A uh, more polished fighter overall. And if he does knock him down and try to get the walk-off KO this time, looks back and Kinoshita's still there, still trying to scramble. Yeah, go in for that grounded kick instead of the, the hammer fist this time. Sh give the fans what they want, baby. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. I should do, do, a, do a stomp. Do the LeBron oh. James stomp, stomp walk-off. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Uh, moving up the card, we got Joe O'Reilly against newly signed and tough veteran, longtime EFC champion. He's become a champion, I think, two or three times now in EFC. We have uh, Nakzimulo Zulu against Joe O'Reilly. And this one should be a lot of fun as well. Funny enough, Zulu actually lost on the Ultimate Fighter. And it was the champion's Ultimate Fighter season to see who out of the global champions was going to win the tournament and get that fight against Demetrius Johnson in... Kind of a full circle, perfect narrative. He lost to Ogikubo on the show. You know, 
Ryzen darling and, and former champion for Ryzen as well, and now title contender for Ryzen. So Zulu fighting in Japan for the first time. He's 15, 6, and 1 as a pro, 35 years of age, 2, 2, and 1 draw in his last five fights. Um, but like I said, long time EFC fighter, multiple time champion in that promotion, which is the top promotion in South Africa that actually has produced a ton of great fighters um, who are not just South African. Like he fought Jake Hadley actually in 2019. He lost his belt to Jake Hadley in 2019 in that promotion as well. And he's fought uh, Demarte Pena in EFC Africa 13 as well. Um, but he did beat a 5-0 guy and a 4-2 guy in his last two fights. He's 13-6-1 in EFC, 6 KOTKOs, 7 submissions, never been submitted, 2 decisions. He's lost 5 times via decision and he's only been knocked out once. Joe Orai, 16-11-2, 4-1 in his last 5 fights. And let's be perfectly honest, we all had him beating Kondo in his last fight. And Kondo... I hate saying the word fluke because it's fighting. Anything can happen in fighting, and I don't want to be disrespectful. But let's be honest. Kondo was the big underdog in that one and caught him in an upset finish that brought us all out of our seats just yelling, Oh! Oh my goodness! Um, but still fairly young in the world of mixed martial arts and in age at 26 years uh, of age. 11 KOTKOs, one submission for decision. He's never lost a decision. So he goes out on his shield, either getting knocked out three times or submitted eight times. He's 0 and 1 in Ryzen, 12 6 and 1 in Shuto, Brazil, and also fought. Uh, four times in Kingdom uh, Air Gaze. Now again, lost his last fight to Kondo, but before then uh, won the Shuto Championship, and he defended it once as well. Actually, defended it twice as well. Who do you have in this one, J-Wolf? Man, what a... Aisha, your intros are just sensational. I check love... Out my notes. Check out my notes. Whoops. Check out my notes, bro. Man, it's, it's an absolute sensational job, Aisha. Man, I, I just, I was just enjoying this, listening to you talk about these fights right now, man. That was incredible. But this is one of the bangers of the card right here that I am really looking forward to because, as you were, like Aisha perfectly stated, I mean, Zulu is this international fighter, hot prospect coming over that's a, a tough veteran. And just, I mean, just, I cannot wait to see what he can do on the superior rule set. And he's fighting a tough uh, veteran of Joe Arai that has put on some bangers as well. Like, like he was saying, the Shuto champion that, you know, would come off a, a, a crazy, uh, we're not going to say fluke loss, but I mean, it was a, it was a crazy upset. upset. It was an loss. upset, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, this. It's, it's a good matchup. It's a fantastic matchup, and I cannot wait to see how it plays out. I can't wait to see what Zulu can do on a superior rule. So, like I was saying, I mean, this is, I mean, it's hard to pick a winner in this one, but I'm going with Zulu because I just think, you know, international guy coming in here, he wants to put a stamp and make it known, hey, I have arrived in Japan, and I'm just hoping that he knows the assignment and he wants to get some superior rule set highlights on his repertoire, on his highlight reel, and just announce to Japan, hey, I'm here. I'm coming for that title. So this is this is one of the new signings, and I'm I'm bringing that fire, and we're we're going all the way to the top. So pull up Michael Chandler. See you at the top. <laughs> Another potential guy that they can enter in the Flyway Grand Prix that we are just hoping and praying for, right? They they sign that Canadian from BTC. They're bringing Kyrgyzstanis over. They're bringing Kazakhstanis over. Now they're bringing South Africans over, dude. It's going to happen. Oh, it's yeah. Thank you so happen. much for bringing that up, Aisha. Thank you. Oh, man. I just can't you hear that, Drew? That. It's going to happen. <laughs> yes, it is going to happen 100%. 100%. They're going to do the Flyweight Grand Prix. Because what else are they going to do with the with the Flyweight division? Have rematches with Horiguchi and, and Shinryu and, and... Ogi Kubo over and over and over again? No. No, no. Not the Flyweight Grand Prix is the way to go. That is the clear... I mean, that's... I mean, take my money right now. Look at all these guys are signing, including. Well, let's see what Zulu can do here. Maybe, maybe they'll announce because they're they're saying there's going to be some announcements during the intermission as well. Maybe they announce a flyweight grand prix, and maybe Zulu is going to be you know featured in it. I mean, who, I can't wait to see find out. But just I I just can't thank you enough for bringing that up because you know that's been a passion of mine oh, yeah. for a, for years now. 
that I want a flyweight Grand Prix with Horiguchi in it, and it's just going to be sensational when it happens. And just um, just take my take my freaking money right now. I just can't wait for it. It's going to be freaking awesome. I also have Zulu in this one to win, dude. Um, he's the way better grappler, and Joe Arai has lost most of his fights in the grappling department because he's a striker first and foremost. And I think that's an opportunity for Zulu to employ some of that superior rule set with those grounded knees, especially if he's going from the half guard to side control. He can get that right arm over the neck and just start kneeing and kneeing and kneeing to the face and or, you know, upper body area there because he's not necessarily like the like the best wrestler or anything like that because grappling isn't Zulu's bread and butter. It's not his main weapon. Like he's a very good striker. He's He's got long arms. He's pretty big for the division. He's lanky and he's good at landing strikes on the outside. He's also very durable. I know Jorai has a lot of knockouts and is a lot younger than him, but Zulu's only been knocked out once in his entire pro mixed martial arts career uh like i said multiple efc champs so both these guys ha have had gold around their waist but yeah joe arise though he's been in a lot of mixed martial arts fights now his grappling is still a weakness now his takedown defense has gotten better but i think if zulu attacks the legs on the outside um employs the jab and starts and, and honestly starts throwing a lot of feints level change feints that really diminish Joe Arai from being aggressive, the aggressive Joe Arai that he is and kind of gets in his own head thinking like, when's the takedown going to come? I think that's where Zulu can either keep it on the feet and once he's in his head, just piece him up on the outside or eventually land that takedown, get the dominant position and go for the ground and pound finish or submission. Now, like again, submissions aren't his bread and butter, but he has a lot of them on his resume as well. He has seven submission wins, like I said. So just overall, he's way more well-rounded. He's getting older, but I still think he's going to be dialed for this one, especially after that walkout. Like he hasn't fought. I mean, EFC is a great promotion, this is the biggest stage he's ever fought on, right? Especially a numbered card. This ain't no landmark card. This is a numbered card. This is a huge event, and I think he's going to be dialed, and I think he'll either get the sub or get the dominant uh, unanimous decision win against uh, Joe Arai. And it's going to be over 10,000 people there. The landmark cards almost have 10,000 people as well. Super Ryzen 3 that just happened had 48,000 people in attendance. So these are not small crowds. Not sm this, is, this is a big stage. Right here, yeah. like I should say, this is one part of the biggest stage that he's going to be fighting on. I mean, I, I, I said 10,000, I meant 20,000. 20, this is a number to bit, and it might have upwards of 20,000 people in this arena for him. So, for sure, this is the biggest stage he's ever fought on. Great point. I mean, just he's going to want to show out, he's going to want to show, show what he can do. So, I, I just, man, I just can't wait to see. What, but, Joe, like you're saying, Joe Wright, he's not. He's not some uh, you know just pushover guy. So it's like, I mean, even though he's not doesn't have, doesn't have the grappling, he's still an excellent fighter. So this is, I mean, this is an excellent matchup here. That the matchmakers they did a good job on this one. Yeah. So we're really gonna get to see what Zulu can do, and if if he's like you know if he's worthy of being in that flyweight Grand Prix, <laughs> yeah. which I just, I'm, we're anticipating he's going to be. <laughs> if, if Zulu was a little bit like chinny, like if he's been, if he's been knocked out say north of three times, I would honestly pick Joe Arai as an underdog here because he is the underdog at plus 300. Zulu is minus 400. So like pretty wide odds for this one. But like you said, Joe Rye, he's no slouch. This one is a, a good, he's not a can, but he's not like a high level guy. It's kind of the perfect matchup to, to bring Zulu into the promotion. Um, speaking of a, a guy that they're bringing into the promotion right now off of the deep regional Japanese scene, we have Kiyoma Akimoto against uh, Kintaro. That's right, y Yuto uh, Hokamura. Now, this one, like, don't look at the betting odds right away. Don't look at the topology picks right away. This one is an interesting one to predict but we'll preview it before we get our official predictions here because we have the veteran up against the young up-and-comer. That is right, Akimoto's 5-0 and as a pro, only 18 years of age, and he's fought every single one of his fights um, on either the deep regional scene, Gladiator, or fighting Agent War. So regional scenes in Japan, deep and Gladiator being some pretty high-level ones. And he also went 2-0 as an amateur. Now, this is the best opponent he will ever be fighting. The last guy he fought, and credit to him, was 22-10-4. So, like, 
a, a very experienced fighter who he knocked out in the second round, by the way. Before then, though, he got three uh, first round knockouts in a row was against a 2-0 and guy, 1-2, and and 1-0. and Now, I'm not going to knock him for that. He was 1-0, 2-0, and 3-0 and respectively. So, like, I, and I always say this, Jay Wolf, I never really knock a fighter or judge a fighter too much on the guys who they're fighting until they get to that like five and no mark because then i expect you to take a step up in competition before then you're on the regional scene you're going to take whoever comes across you know whatever contract comes across your desk because you need to get those reps you need to get paid and you need to build your resume he is a knockout menace and he has gone the distance before in his first fight in gladiator he got a unanimous decision going the distance so he he has proven that he can grapple. He has proven that he's pretty well-rounded, but for the most part since then, he's just been knocking motherfuckers out. So he he is he is dangerous and he does have good hands and he's got decent power for still just an 18-year-old. But Kintaro's no slouch either. Now, is he in kind of the decline of his career? I would say yes. He's four or one in four in his last five fights. He did win his last fight unanimous decision and it was a fair decision i think he should have won that one but he just didn't look as dangerous in that fight as he has been in years past when he was dominating and putting together win streaks i will say the four uh, losses that he has in his last five fight were against pretty good opponents in a 19 and 5 guy horiguchi uh motoya as well as in a way so like Again, not the worst losses, and he was and he wasn't finished in any of those losses either. Actually, sorry, he was he he got submitted by Horiguchi. But in the other three guys, he lost split decision and two unanimous decisions. So like not the worst losses, but he does look like he's in the decline here. Hard one to pick. Who are you going with? I actually want I'm looking forward to seeing what this is another young prospect. Like you were saying, a young hot prospect, 18 years old. Come here five and zero. Oh, I mean, just this is an introduction to the big stage, and what an introduction that is with Kintaro, an all action fighter, like you were saying, pretty veteran. And you know, I I, I don't know if he if I would say he's in the decline. Maybe he is because he's older, but he just seems slower in his fights. That that's all. I think that might be because he was coming off all those losses. You know, then they were like you were saying, they were close losses, close split decision losses. So it wasn't like he was getting blown out or anything, right? So I'm wondering if maybe he was just trying to like fight, uh, fight smarter, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? Instead of like you know, because he was in his previous fights, like you were saying, action fighter coming out, guns blazing, just going for the kill all the time. So maybe he was trying to be more measured in his approach and be like a, a smarter fighter, and maybe that's what gave the impression that maybe he's like declining. But that's why it was like a decision win, you know, just because he wanted to get that win, but, you know, he wanted to in that that uh, the losing streak right and get back in the win column so i'm wondering if that could be what it was but we'll that's what we're going to find out in this fight right here yeah. so i think it's a, another fantastic matchup like i said a gritty veteran that's an all action fighter against a young hot up-and-coming prospect that's just you know this is welcome to the big stage like aisha was saying he's on the, he's in the the japanese regionals and, and the like deep is a fantastic promotion. Like I actually was saying in the intro, they're, they're probably one of the main feeder promotions for the Epic Rise. And they have guys that go back and forth and girls like Siki Izawa. That's yep. on this card right here. She headlined a deep card and won the belt. Not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So deep is a good promotion and they produce some great fighters. And, you know, I can't wait to see what this kid can do right here. So I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, I, I, my heart says Kentaro, but my head, actually my, my heart says the, the young gun, but my head says Kentaro because I just, I don't think that he's like, I, I just don't think he's, I think he was taking a measured approach in his previous fight. I really do. Ex a huge step up, right? Like you were saying, he's only fought one other time where it was a, a, a real like good opponent, like 22 and 10. I, I think you said it was. So this right now, this is another. This, but this guy has a big stage. Kintaro has big stage experience, and this is um, uh, Akimoto's first big stage uh, fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great point actually, because Kintaro not only is he has does he have big stage experience in Ryzen, where he went three and five in Ryzen. He fought for the Pancrase title. He fought uh, nine times there as well before coming over to Ryzen. He put together a win streak in Pancrase to fight for the title there. And Pancrase is a is a big time promotion as well. Yeah, so uh, is Akimoto gonna have any you know what they call it the UFC jitters? 
Right. Is he going to have any big stage jitters here? With because you know, Ryzen is a huge stage. It's bigger than any other promotion you spot for. Bigger than Pan Crazy Deep, all that stuff. Like we were saying, it's probably going to have north of twenty thousand fans in attendance for sure. Over fifteen thousand fans. So it's. I mean, this, this is a big stage. So will he have any jitters? And Kintaro has been there before. He's been in these tough battles, as, as you were talking about with his record being, cl and the losses were close losses. So if he is not on the decline. Like like we were like you were saying, I should. If it is what I was suspecting that maybe he was just taking a more measured approach, fighting a little bit smarter, trying to get back in the win column. I mean, I, I could see him giving a rude a welcoming to Akimoto here and and telling Young Gun, hey, you know, welcome welcome to the big show, youngster. You know, so yeah. we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. But I I do want Akimoto to win so we can get another uh, hot prospect in this you know fantastic promotion. But I my my heart says Akimoto. But my head says, I, I just don't think Kentaro's passed it that much yet. And I think the veteran experience is going to be too much for the young gun. But we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I mean, that's that's why they fought the fight. So this is another fantastic matchup. I, I, just, I just love this. This whole card is just banger after banger, like we were talking about in the intro. So it's, it's going to be a great fight to see what happens. Absolutely. And this is surprisingly one of two fights that still doesn't have betting odds yet. Really? So, wow. So, so like, it, oh, it, like, it's tough because if Kintaro was the underdog, I'd be smashing that shit. However, I could... Be, because if... Um, and again, topology picks are, are crazy, but it's the only thing we can really go off of here. 89% say Akimoto, but topology picks tend to be biased towards guys who are undefeated, even with a 5-0 and record. So... I am going to pick Akimoto, but I'm not super confident. Like, he has power, but, you know, Kintaro hasn't been knocked out in his last five fights. He's been submitted. So, if this kid knocks him out, it's like, okay, he's he's the real deal. He's the real deal, because the, the last guy he knocked out was a veteran uh, as well. So... He does have a lot of finishes on his feet, good KOs, good grappling, but like I said, never fought anyone on Kintaro's level or really anyone with Kintaro's resume who's, you know, been in championship fights and who's fought the top of Ryzen. Um, so, yeah, I'm leaning with the young guy, but I I'm not super confident on this one. I do think this one could go either way or we could see one of... I, I don't want to use the word fraud check because Akimoto's way too young to, like, be a fraud, but it could be one of those, like, welcome to the big leagues, kid, right? Go back to the drawing board and, and polish up a few of these things. Exactly. And that's interesting that you say there's no odds yet. If when the odds come out, if Kintaro is, in fact, an underdog in this, that is, that's probably one of the livest dogs on the entire card then. I, I, I just think that that would be, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's like, you know, like plus, like you, you said the, uh, the, what earlier, Joe Arai was plus 300. If Kintaro is like, South of that, like, you know, like plus 200 or even or, or like plus 100. I think that's a live dog right there. I, I, I really do. So, yeah. but we'll see. I mean, Akimoto, yeah. I mean, you know, topology, they're picking, he said 89% are going with Akimoto. And like you're saying, I mean, Kintaro might be on the downside of his career. So, I mean, it just, but you're, you're absolutely right. This is a total pick on go either way. Could be the young gun, could be the gritty veteran. We just got. That's why we got to see the fight to watch it. But I mean, yeah. it just. I I just I, I'm I'm surprised there's no odds that. That's interesting. Has that ever happened before? Why Why do you think the odds makers haven't put odds out on this fight yet? That's that's I interesting. Think, so for those listening, we're recording this Wednesday night, and you it's it's usually Wednesday night, Thursday morning is when all the odds come out. Like even 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 today, like. There, as we record this Wednesday night, there's a few on here that weren't on here this morning when I did my prep. So I think they're just trickling in now. So I'm going to be very interested to see what the odds are on this one. So if you guys are listening, sorry, we don't have odds on this one yet, but it's probably going to be close to a pick -em. And if Kentaro is the underdog, that's a good underdog, given that he doesn't get knocked out easy. This kid's a knockout artist, but this kid has gone and... He's gone the distance before and shown that he he is well-rounded. So I'm just going to bank on him doing more damage to win this one, even though Kintaro is the veteran and overall well-rounded guy. Yes. Okay. That's a great, great. And I'm going to go opposite. I'm going to go, even though I want my, my heart says, I want Akimoto, the young gun, to get the victory and get, you know, announce himself on the big stage. My head is saying that the gritty veteran Kintaro has still got it. He's not all the way on the on the downside of his career yet. It's just going to be too much 
for a young gun, 18 year old kid, first fight on the big stage to overcome. So I'm picking my head's picking Kentaro, and I'm saying that he, if he is the underdog, that's a live dog right there to bet. So that, that's 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 what that's how we're gonna p- p- finish this one. That's what the picks. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Let's move on to the next one, which pff, another fight that has. That's that should be just absolute fireworks. We have Kohei Hagiwara against Kyo uh, Takagi. Now, Ryo Takagi, seven and two as a pro, three and two in his last five fights. He did win his uh, last fight up against a six and six guy, where he knocked out in the first round. Hagiwara, seven and nine as a pro, one and four in his last five fights. Essentially just a pure striker who can't grapple to save his life. However, however, Koji Takeda didn't submit him in the last fight, and he was able to get back up to his feet many, many times against the spamming wrestler Koji Takeda. So there have been improvements in his ability to get back up to his feet and his takedown defense um, since his earlier career, even just since a year ago. Um, Hagiwara, like I said... It, a striker, despite him being under 500 with his record, five KO TKO, zero submissions. He's lost via submission six times. Uh, two decisions, he's lost via decision three times. Six and seven in Ryzen. Look, one of the reasons why he's still there is because at least when he goes up against a striker, he puts on exciting fights. But yeah, in his last five, shoot, in his last six, he's only gotten one win. And he's been rear naked choke and triangle arm barred. Uh, two times he's been rear naked choke and he's been triangle arm barred um, early in the fight, all of those submissions as well. Now, on the other end, Takaji, not necessarily a great grappler either, but I will say a little bit more well rounded. And he's got some heavy hands as well. Like I said, 7 and 2 is a pro, still relatively young, 25 years of age, 6 KO TKOs, 0 submissions, 1 decision. And one of his losses has come via decision. One of his losses has come via submission. He's 1 and 1 in Ryzen, 6 and 1 in Pancras. Again, lost his Ryzen debut via unanimous decision, but came back. In that one to get a first round knockout last April. Who do you got in this one? Man, you know, I just absolutely love Hagiwara. He's one of the big names of Ryzen in Japan. That's why they keep, you know, like you're saying, his record is his record is deceptive. Let's just put it that way. Because the guy's an action fighter. He's getting better at the grappling. Kind of like Ren Hiromoto. You know, Ren Hiromoto's a striker, uh, kickboxing crossover that you know is is shown obviously. Now he's the, he's the last man standing champion that just happened at Super Ryzen 3. That, you know, and before that, he was showing great growth in his grappling. Same thing with Bay Noah, right? Another striker, uh, to, you know, turned mixed martial artist to where they're, they're, they're showing up. You can see their progression with their yeah. grappling game. Hagiwara is one of those fighters where you can see the progression. His grappling game is getting better each fight, even in these losses. He was showing good growth with his grappling. Well, especially the last two. Like, you go the distance against uh, Ushiku and uh, Takeda. Like, that's improvements. Yes, both guys, wrestlers, grapplers, right? So that's that's huge improvements to, you know, just... I, I'm just I'm really high on Hagiwara. He, he's one of the names of the promotion. Like, he's a big star in Japan. They, they love him. I mean, the guy... He, and he also, he had one of my favorite knockouts in Ryzen on the... the Probably one of the top three rising cards ever. Uh, I'm talking about Trigger First, their mm-hmm. first cage event. Hagiwara had a fantastic grounded kick KO to absolutely cherry that card and make it one of the best in rising history. And just th- so the guy knows the assignment, you know, he knows to utilize the superior rule set, and he's a great action fighter that is have been shown improvement in his grappling department. So I'm really hoping. My heart and my head is picking him to win this one. I just, I, I really, I'm really high on him. I, I just, and I'm, I'm hoping that they're trying to build a rematch between him and Ren Hiramoto, possibly for the last man standing belt, because you know they, their first fight was a fantastic fight as well. Two big name Japanese fighters. So I'm, I'm hoping that's what happens. But I mean, hey, Ryo Takagi, like you're saying, seven and two. The guy is, is you know, this, this is a tough fight for uh, obviously. I mean, every single fight on this card is well matched. And this is another one right here. So this it's not like Takai is to be a pushover for Hagiwara. So he's going to have to bring his A game. He's going to have to really show that he has progressed very well in his grappling department. If he can do that, 
I think he can get the knockout. I really do. I think he can get the knockout. And if he gets a knockdown, this is a prime candidate right here for some superior rule set action because he has already proven in the past that he knows the assignment and can land a superior rule set finish. So, you know, that's that's what I'm hoping for in this one. So that I just that's, I'm just really looking forward to this fight right here. I, I just I can't praise Hagiwara enough. Like he's he's one of the stars of Ryzen, especially in Japan, because they the fans love him. I mean, it's it's you know, same thing with Ren Hiramoto, just and now especially at the Super Ryzen three, winning the belt from from Akiru, I mean it just the guy's in superstar status. So I think building into a rematch with him would be fantastic for the promotion. I hope that's the direction they're going. So that, that, that's what I like to see. I like to see Hagawara win in sensational fashion, a superior rule set, build into a rematch with uh, Randy Hirmoto for a last man standing belt. And earlier today, and still on Betway, actually, this one's pretty much a pick 'em. Uh, Tagag, uh, Takagi is minus 120, Hagiwara is minus 110. Now, on Bet Online, the odds have moved a little bit, whereas Takagi is still the favorite, but at minus 205, and Hagiwara at plus 165. So that just shows that, like, there are, there are deficiencies in uh, Ryo Tagagi's game where. Maybe those deficiencies are enough where Hagiwara can keep this on the feet with his improvements and at least take down defense um, where he showed against two really like top level grapplers in his last fights. This one, I think I might be burned on because I'm leaning towards the favor here. Um, I'm, I'm going to lean on Ryo Tagagi to win this one. I just think though Hagiwara hits hard as well, and in my opinion, probably has the faster hands. He puts together better combos. I like how he goes to the body. I like how he sets up those four punch combos. One to the body, left hook to the head, another right to the body, then like straight left. We've seen him throw that combo countless times, and if he's in the pocket, he will outbox you. Having said that, I think Rio just has that straight up just power advantage. Where if he lands a straight punch or an overhand, he can knock anyone out. And I will say he's a little bit more well-rounded, but he's primary a striker. I think he's just a little bit more, again, dangerous, even though Hagiwara could be considered more of the technical boxer and or scrapper. Um... I don't want to say that he doesn't have zero grappling anymore, but you know, it's, I still think it's a little bit lesser than that of, uh, Takagi. I think this is going to end with whoever gets the KO. I don't think there's going to be some wrestling throughout the fight unless Rio is losing on the feet and is just like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go with what I know is your weakness and try to finish this on the ground. Now, Hagiwara, it is important to note that he has never been knocked out yet, and I still think that Rio has the knockout ability to put him out. So that that's how high I am on uh, Rio's power. But having said that, Hagiwara is an absolute brawler and a dog and can take a lot of damage. So I might be burned on this one. This one is a pick em for a reason, but I am going with the slight favorite um, in the slight younger fighter here in Rio uh, Takagi. And that's, you know, that's interesting that one of the odds makers has, has it, you know, pretty much even and both of them at, at minus a hundred. And then one of them has a uh, Hagiwara plus a hundred or something. 165, which is that. Yeah, that's a good dog. That's a good dog pick for sure. hundred percent. That, that's even better than the other one. I, I think that's, that's probably the livest dog on the, on the, the card then. Cause I mean, I, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I can't tell you, I'm really high on Hagiwara. I think he's really improved his grappling. I think he's going to be able to get this done. So, you know, if those, if those betting odds are still like that and they have him as a plus, you know, underdog, that, that that's a live dog bet right there. So my, my heart and my head is picking Hagiwara on this one. I just think it's going to be – I just think he's he's going to bring it and he's going to say, get on the mic afterwards and call out Ren for the rematch. I think they're going to build into that. It's going to be sensational. So I just hope it happens. <laughs> Could you imagine an actual last man standing where they do the rule set that Saki Kabara wanted to do, where it's unlimited rounds, live scoring after three, and the first one to throw in the towel or who gets knocked out loses between those two? There'd be no grappling. They'd just be standing in the pocket there, freaking Ashizawa style, going ham. Yes, that'd be so sensational. That'd be, man, I, 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 
Honestly, I, I seriously hope that happens. The, the exactly the scenario you just played out there about, you know, Scott Guevara's original plans for the last man standing belt to be unlimited rounds and actually go until one, you know, the last man standing. That's, you know, and he was saying that they might do that in the future. They just couldn't get that done for the... It's a, it's up to the venue. It's the venue, like it's at the venue's discretion. If if they don't have like a hard stop where like no, our staff have to come in here and clean up at this time. If if a venue has some wiggle room, like back in the day they did against you know like Gracie and um, uh, Sakurawa. Well, Sakurawa. I was just gonna say Gracie and like any of the Gracies really because they all had those crazy fucking rules. But uh, no, yeah, the Sakuraba fight and Gracie in particular. Then that, you know, that's the one that that Sakaki Barasan wanted to model. Yep. the last man standing after because remember that one went on for like an hour and a half or something yeah, crazy 90, like. 90 plus minutes which was wild <laughs> so, yeah. and that's the Saki bar wanted to recreate that magic and i believe that this fight if hockey war can get it done and set up the the rematch with ren for last night that this would be a prime candidate to complete that vision of Saki bar son so that's what i'm really hoping happens and i just you know and it's just really interesting that the odds makers have it really close, and one of them has him as an underdog. I think that is probably the livest underdog bet of the entire card. Then even more so than the than the other ones. So that's just than the, the Kitaro. So I mean, this man, I just can't wait to see how it plays out. It's going to be awesome. And in textbook fashion, it's with a guy who has an under 500 record. But that's Japanese right. MMA, baby. <laughs> but hey, remember, that's a deceptive record. Hagimara, it it's a very deceptive record. He's a great fighter, and he has been pr- showing very good improvements in his grappling. So, you know, and they threw him into the fire right away. As That's how a lot of those Japanese records are like that, is because they take these guys and they throw them into the fire right away. That's like what I think they were doing with, uh, you know, the Kentaro and uh, Akimoto fight. They're taking this young gun. Throwing him in there with a with a gritty veteran right away to see what he can do. So and but I mean with Hagiwara, they were even doing that. You know, they do it more extreme sometimes. Like with Hagiwara, that's why his record is it was the same. It's a deceptive record. Don't don't be discouraged by his under five hundred record. He's a good good fighter, and this could be the fight that gets him back up to five hundred. And the fact that he's you know the odds makers. On one of the, the sites, like you were saying, they both have as minus, and one of them has them as just a plus one hundred underdog. Man, that's 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 really cool. That's interesting, and I, I think that's the livest dog of the whole card here. Then that, that's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see how that fight plays out. On to the next one. We got Yusuke Yachi against Sho Patrick Usami. Banger after banger after banger, man. Savage Usami, seven and two as a pro, three and two in his last five fights. He won his last fight um, via beautiful knockout against uh, Tokudome. Uh, Yusuke Yachi, also three and two in his last five fights, twenty six and fourteen as a pro, and he lost his last fight in Bellator, actually. But a terrible matchup for him going up against uh, Mansoor Barnoui, who pretty much just mauled him and eventually got the Darce choke in that one. That, that was in France too. That was on Barnoui's home yeah, turf, basically. Exactly. So yeah. it was like it was like a they were just throwing like a land of the slaughter in that one. So, but you know, no shame in that loss for him. But no, and, and props to him going over to Bellator too. I love how even though Bellator is now PFLator, there's still there's still a little cross promotion there, and I and I dig that they allow fighters to go back and forth. And um, and the rumored New Year's Eve collaboration mega event that's going to be happening. I cannot wait to hear. I don't know if we're going to get. Uh, you know, during the intermission, if we're going to get any announcements for that yet, well, maybe I think, we, I think we might because, like, we're getting close to that event, and that's the only one on Bellator's calendar that they still haven't like confirmed yet. I think it's going to be like we've seen in years past. I think it's going to be Bellator versus Ryzen, and then the Ryzen New Year's card. So I think we're going to get back to back cards in Japan. I'm hoping the same thing, Aisha, and I'm just hoping that you know I, I'm, all, I'm giving props to Don Davis for for making it happen and allowing it to happen because we're hoping that the the headliner is going to be Patricio Pound for Pound Pitbull versus Chihiro Suzuki yes. for the title. You know, that's the one we've been asking for. But what I'm really hoping for is that Don Davis goes all the way, goes full badass, and allows the superior rule set for these crossover fights, exactly like the first Ryzen versus Bellator show. I, I just hope he does not puss out and you and makes them use the pussified unified rule set for these crossover bouts. And then it just, that would defeat the purpose. I think, I think that 
I, I, just, anyway, just, that's just uh, you know, props to him for that's probably what's going to happen is this collaboration mega event on New Year's Eve. But please, Don Davis, allow the superior rule set for these fights. Go all the way full badass and allow that to happen. It would just be absolutely sensational. And absolutely. exactly what you're saying, Aisha, it's going to be hopefully you know, a two-parter card, be a rising portion, and then the Bellator versus rising portion afterwards. Just and hope it be five versus five again. Just absolutely sensational. Just kind of, and, and like you're saying, Yusaki Yachi. He, he was, you know, part of that collaboration. He went over to on, you know, the enemy's turf, basically, with going into the, the lion's den, basically, Barnawi's home turf to fight a, 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 you know, accomplished international fighter like Barnawi on his home turf. So that was, that was really big of him to do that. So, oh, you know, I didn't mean to cut you off on your intro all, here. All good. All good. I was, I just I, I just love this fight. I mean, Yachi is one of their big names too. This is another yeah. big name Japanese fighter for them, and he's such a big name that, like you were saying, actually, he's been part of collaboration bouts with PFL Tour and Bellator before that. He actually was. I mean, I mean, do you remember the first uh, the Bellator um, collaboration? It was like the uh, Team to the Junk, our fr a good friend Team to the Junk. He called it the pilot episode for Bell mm -hmm. for uh, the Epic Rising in the Cage. Remember, it was the Bellator post limbs uh, yes. on, on, on the Fader versus Rampage card, the Bellator yeah. Japan card, right? And Yachi was the the main event for that, and he scored a soccer. Uh, excuse me. Oh my goodness. Excuse me. He scored a grounded kick knockout in that post slim main event. And that was sort of the catalyst or, or the pilot uh, for, for them implementing the cage. Now, that's why we have landmarks, which used to be trigger cards. They're called landmarks. Now, that's where Ryzen utilizes the cage and has fights in the cage. So and superior rule set fights in the cage. And Yachi, uh, we, we believe, was the big part of that, the catalyst mm -hmm. to making that happen. So... He's, he's uh you know got a special place in my heart. I, I hope he gets the win here, but you know he's he's coming off a loss, like you're saying. And Usami, no no slouch. So it's just, I mean, it's it's just another banger fight right here. So anyways, sorry I didn't mean to cut you off on the intro. Here, finish the intro. Just no, I I I love it. it. It's hardly an intro. It's just it's just my thoughts teeing them up, and we were getting your thoughts on the matter, and that's what this show's all about. What I love about Yachi though is he's fought a murderer's row. Of fighters in Ryzen. He's fought Luis Gustavo. He's fought Roberto uh, Souza twice. He's fought Satoshi once for the title where he lost. He's he's fought uh, Takeda. He's he's fought Mikru, Johnny Case. He's fought Luis Gustavo twice. Couldn't couldn't beat him, but that's okay. That's okay. Fought Alexander Volkanovsky back in the day as well. Actually lost his PXC title to Alexander Volkanovsky back in 2015. He fought Kleber. He fought Rodolfo uh, Rubio, who he beat in Pancrase. He fought uh, Takanori Gomi. I mean, bro, he's fought everyone he's fought everyone and even legends um in his career which is what i really respect about him he's only 34 years of age but he is getting up there in age I and mean, he's taking a lot of damage throughout his career uh six ko tkos four submissions 16 decisions so he's incredibly well-rounded i do like his boxing though and like you said he's very good at employing that superior rule set when able Usami's no joke though. So this is another like up and coming guy who's starting to prove himself at the highest level versus someone in Yachu probably, I mean, it's Japan, so he's probably got 10 years left, but let's be honest. He probably doesn't have that many years left in his prime. Dude, I saw a 52 year old woman fighting deep the other weekend. It was absolutely insane. Gotta love Japanese MMA. Um, Usami's only 24 years of age, six KO TKO, zero submissions, one decisions, three and one in Ryzen. And yeah, Tokudome was his that was that step up in competition. Before then, like he lost to Kyung Po Kim, and he got absolutely destroyed by him in the first round, rear naked choke. And before then, it's not like he went up against the best guys. When he did uh, take his first step up in competition against uh, Osawa, who was thirteen and six, he lost the decision. Went on a two fight win streak in Ryzen after that, knocking out Bay Noah, knocking out Sasaki, who Sasaki is pretty good as well, twenty and twelve guy. But I, I really do think that Yachi is just that that step above the rest, and this is his time to 
to prove himself. If he can beat Yachty, it's like, okay, you have arrived. You're going to be now one of Ryzen's guys that we put up against the higher level competition. I am going to go with Usami to win this one, though. I think odds finally dropped for this one. Yes, he is the slight favorite at minus 210. Yachi's coming in at plus 170. And Usami, the last time I checked, had nine or 77% on tapology. So not as one-sided. And I figured he would be in the favorite he would be the favorite for this one. He's 10 years younger. He's never been knocked out. Has honestly lost against good opponents when he tried to take a step up in competition. And there's no shame in losing to uh, Kyung Pao Kim. I actually absolutely love that fighter personally, especially in the grappling department because he's an absolute stud there. But this will be another test, as I said, as he's crushed cans on the way up and then has only proven himself a couple times against high-level opponents. Yachi is so well-rounded, though, so aggressive, either on the ground or on the feet. Um, and, and Yachi's really only lost to, like, the best guys. And he's beaten really good guys as well. I'm picking Usami here because I do think he will stuff the takedowns that Yachi will eventually dish out because Yachi he's one of those like true mixed martial arts fighters he'll throw everything in the kitchen sink at you and I like Usami striking will I say it's better well I don't know yet but it's definitely dangerous and he hits hard and it's not like Yachi hasn't been knocked out in his career he's been knocked out quite a few times in his career so or at least TKO'd so I do think Usami is going to get the KO or TKO finish here i did write in my notes before the draw before the odds dropped when i was doing prep that i imagined they would be close and they are relatively close yachi not a bad underdog for being the the savvy veteran but i am going with usami to get the the tko finish i'm gonna do the same I'm, my, my head is picking usami for all the reasons you just laid out i mean yachi he's got a lot of fight miles on him yeah like you were saying he's only 34 but a lot of fight miles against some very against top competition so even though he's going to be the savvy veteran, like you're saying, it's just, I mean, this Usami is just an up and coming young gun. That's, I, I think that they're, they, they want to, you know, that's why they're matching this up right here. They're matching it up so that, you know, if Usami wins, he's beating, you know, a big Jap, a big name Japanese fighter, right? And he's propelled himself to the next level, you know, going to be taking that, you know, trip to the title shot eventually. So that's what that he's trying to, you know, make a name for himself off of. But I mean, hey, Yachi, like you were saying, well-rounded, great, you know, gritty veteran, and just been fought, you know, as you know, the competition edge. He has fought a who's who, of, as, you know, everybody, like you were saying. So it's it's and it's interesting that the odds makers have it so close. I think that Yachi could be another live dog here. You said he's only plus one hundred something. That's really close. That's that's a good that's a good underdog bet right there as well. But again, I'm agreeing with you on this one. Aisha. I I just think that Usami, the young gun, to be too much for the savvy veteran because he just has a lot of fight miles on him, and he's also coming off of that devastating loss to Barnawi. So I mean, you know, you know, I believe the momentum, and I just think that you know, Usami coming off a win and um, Yachi coming off a loss. I just and all the fight miles on him. My heart wants Yachi to win because, you know, he's the big name Japanese fighter. So I think that'd be better for promotion for the big name to get a win and get back on the win streak. They said, you know, could, you know, put him into a title shot again and maybe sometime in the future. Who knows? I mean, it depends on who wins the titles at this 48 event, right? Both the former Yachi opponents. So yeah. could be said, you know what I mean? Could be said, but we'll see. But I just think that Usama is going to be too much. So my heart, my heart is picking. Yachi, my head is picking Usami, but Yachi could be a live dog again on this card. That's interesting. The odds makers have him that close as well. Yeah. There's a lot of really close uh, fights on this card, both just like resume wise and eye test from us watching these guys and, and knowing a lot of them and watching a lot of their fights and on the odds makers, including this next one, which is uh, Jintaro Ushiku, the fighting bull against Shoko Sato. Now, Shoko Sato, 37 years of age, but still fighting 
top competition and beating top competition. He's 35, 16, and 2, 3 and 2 in his last five fights. He lost his last fight to uh, Naoki Inoue, but Naoki Inoue didn't finish him. It was a decision. Now, I agree with the decision, but still, Sato looked pretty good in that fight. And before then, beat Ota, split decision there. And in one championship, beat Jai Won Kim, who is 13 and 6. Good opponent in that one, too. Good opponent in that one, too. Um, his opponent, Ushiku, lost his last fight to Ota. So, I mean, I know MMA math never makes sense, but, you know, there, there, there's <laughs> something there. There's something there. Um, before then, beat Hagiwara, uh, lost to Mikura Sakura, uh, Kleber, and Saito. He's two and three in his last five fights. Um, but again, has fought some pretty good competition as well. But he's a lot younger, is the former uh, Ryzen and Deep champ at 29 years of age. Both these guys are well-rounded. Both these guys are well-rounded, but I will say Ushiku, more of a striker overall. Seven KO, TKO, zero submissions, ten decisions. That not, that's not to say he doesn't have wrestling. I'm just saying as far as his grappling and offensive jiu-jitsu, it's not as prominent as his ability to lay and pray at times or hold his opponent up against the corner. Uh, three and three in Ryzen. 13, 7, and 1 in Pancrase, and 6 and 1 in Deep. Now, he beat, like I said, Sato back in 2022 for the title, lost it to Kleber. Again, no shame in that. And actually, that was his second time fighting Sato in a title fight, but has beaten overall some pretty damn good opponents and has put together really good win streaks throughout his career. But man, Sato nearing legend status here. Now I know he hasn't won he hasn't won a, a Ryzen belt just uh just yet, but he has won multiple Shuto belts and he's competed against some top guys. He's 4 and 2 in one championship, 1 and 1 in Ryzen, 2 and 1 in Sengoku Raiden champion and is just a Shuto darling. 20 wins via KO TKO and he's only been knocked out once. 37 years of age. Over 40 fights, and he's only been knocked out once. Three submissions, 12 decisions. Who are you picking on this one? I actually am going with the former champion. You talk because Ushiku is, I mean, you're saying he's not a, a like you were saying, he's a, a kind of like a grinder, a, yeah. a grinding wrestler type of, uh, is that fair to say? I think so, yeah. So, I mean, you're saying he, like, he does the corner stalling and like the, the ground is stalling, but he also can throw, you know, I've seen him throw some ground knees before, so we'll we'll see if he knows the assignment for this one, and and we'll see if, what the ref lets him get away with. But Masimoto is not a, he's no slouch like you're saying, absolute legend, and I just love the breakdown that you that you give each fight. I mean, it's just fantastic background information, you know, about how he's got a winning record in one championship, but in, in Sengoku rating championships as well, veteran. I mean, just fantastic. Fight. So my heart is I will want Masimoto to win. Because I just love the veterans, but I'm gonna go. My head is picking the younger, grinding, uh, you know, former champion. So to to get it done. But hey, Masimoto, he does, you know, he he's a, he's a veteran, and he has, you know, the fight, the fight. He has the ability to nullify the wrestling and grinding style of Ushiku here. So, you know, let's let's just see how it plays out, but. My heart is wanting Masimoto to win for the legend status, but my head is picking Ushiku to win because he's a grinding raster style. And that's, you know, that if, if a guy cannot keep it on the feet against him or find any space to work, right? Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's like if you can't keep it on the feet against Ushiku, you're probably going to get on the wrong end of a decision loss against him, right? So, and also Masimoto is, like you're saying, 37. So, I mean, and. You know he's he's never been knocked. It, we said he's only been knocked out once in that entire career. So, and Ushiku is not really known as like a a, a knockout artist. Like like you were saying, like, like you were saying, it, it, more known as like a, like a grinding raster style. Hold him up against, pin him in the corner, pin him on the ground, throw some ground at knees every once in a while, and and just ride out the decision. So, that's what I'm 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 hoping that doesn't happen here. But that's what if I was betting. That's what I would bet to happen because, you know, Masimoto is, like I saying, 37, so he's getting up there. But, I, I mean, they're both coming off losses, so there's not like a momentum thing here. Given the edge either way, so it's a little bit harder to, to pick on that part. And do you say the odds makers have, have – what do the odds makers say? Is this a close pick-em fight too? This is – 
uh, Ushiku's plus 110 and wow. uh, Sato's minus 140. So Sato is the favorite, yeah. Wow, the, an, another live dog bet right here. There's some good underdogs on this card. Man, this is incredible. I cannot believe the amount of good underdog bets that are on this card here for people that, that enjoy betting on this stuff. I mean, Ushiku is a former champion. Like I actually was saying, 10 years younger, has a grinding st wrestling style where if it's a decision, he's probably going to win it if the other fighter cannot nullify that wrestling grappling and keep it on the feet. And, you know, so it's just, man, this is another live dog here. This, this is incredible. So my heart says Masumoto, but my head says Ushiku is going to get this in the former champion. So that, that, those are my picks. But another live dog. Incredible. Great matchmaking on this Ryzen 48 card. Fantastic. So we're going head to head on this one. I do write in my notes like Ushiku is a, an awesome dog at, at plus 110. Both both do hit hard. Now Ushiku he does have, what did I say, six or seven KOT KOs, but like it, it's. It's not as bread and butter. It's not super polished like like Sato's is, for example. So both hit hard, but I do think that Sato hits harder clearly with all the knockouts that he has on his career. And though he's getting up there in age, I'm going to bank on his chin not going in this fight because it goes it, eventually it's going to go if you get hit a lot. But that's the thing. He doesn't get hit a lot because he's very, very... He's very good on his feet. He's got he's got light footwork even at 37 years of age. Um, I do like his defensive grappling. Now he's kind of been there, done that with a lot of really good opponents as well. Now I know Ushiku's fought the best of the best too, but Sato he's just he's got that veteran savviness uh, even to a level higher than a 23 and 11 guy, given that he's 35, 16, and two. And I think he's a little bit more dangerous on the ground. So, like, yeah, sure, in the clinch or even if Ishuku gets on top of him, I don't think Sato's not going to be able to scramble out of the position and or try to get some submissions from his back or get some nice reversals. I think, I mean, Ushiku definitely has, definitely has a chance to kind of get that grinding lay and pray style, but I think Sato's no slouch off his back. He is very good at scrambling. He's good at getting back up to his feet. And he's he's good at going for submissions from those positions and reversing those as well. And if he keeps us on the feet, he is the better striker. I do think he will crack Ushiku. Now, whether he knocks him out or not is another story, but I do think he cracks him a few good time or a few, yeah, really good times. This should be a back and forth affair, to be perfectly honest. And like I said, I'm banking on Sato's... If anything, I'm banking on his chin not to go in this fight since he's only been knocked out once. I do think he can withstand that grinding style. I do think he'd switch up positions and at least put up some submission attempts enough to get the better of Ishiku or at least get out of his positions. Now, if Ishiku does damage, though does damage while he's in those dominant positions up against up against the ropes up against the corner or when he is in the dominant position that might be the edge if he does grind out a unanimous decision because i don't think he's just going to be laying on sato the whole time i do think sato is going to be scrambling nice nice i agree 100 percent. and odds makers agree too that's yeah. why they have it so close so it's just and it's really interesting that they have ushiku as as a plus 100 underdog that's that's man i can't stress you guys enough how much i just can't believe how many live underdog bets there are on this card that's like what yeah. four in a row we've been talking about that's incredible the whole card other than two fights i mean and again we only have uh nine of the 11 fights on the on the betting odds sheet right now but still all of them that are that are on here right now are close except for obviously the dot beck who is minus 800 and this next one with Kana Asakura against uh, Seika Izawa, the arguably the best atom weight on the planet right now. She's a minus one thousand favorite. Wow! <laughs> and you know what? Like I get it. She's she's one of the best. Her wrestling's incredible. Her grappling is amazing. But Asakura is no slouch. Like Asakura is not a can. So the fact that she's still minus 1,000 and Asuka's plus 500, even plus 600 in some books, despite her not being a bad opponent, not being a tomato can, just shows how good Izawa is. And Izawa is that good. She is undefeated, 13-0, 26 years of age, has won grappling tournaments left, right, and center. Her wrestling is amazing. Her striking is getting better, but like she, she doesn't need it because like she's on you right away. 
she'll strike with you for a little bit, but like it's it's just enough to get in and out of the pocket to find those double legs, single legs, or just grab the body, rip you to the ground, trip you, sweep you, judo throw you. It doesn't matter. She's taking you to the ground. She's finding your back, and she's choking you out. She's she's so strong for an atom weight as well, and even a super atom weight. She is so incredibly strong. For how sure small she is, she's she's beefy. You know what I mean? Like she's 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 just she's so tough as well. Um, mind you, Asakura twenty and seven as a pro. She's also twenty six years of age. Yeah, two and three in her last five fights, and she did fight over a year ago. But she pre she beat a pretty good opponent in May Yamaguchi, who's twenty one fourteen and one. Lost to Siwu Park, no shame in that. Beat uh, Satomi uh, Takano, who was 16 and 12. Um, had a very close split decision against Sori Oshima. Now, Oshima did kind of ragdoll her a little bit, which, you know, I had high hopes for Oshima when she went over to Invicta, and oh boy, was that a disappointment. So, you know, maybe, maybe that loss hasn't aged that well, even though at one time you could say it wasn't the worst loss there. Um, and then had a split decision and a close decision loss against Ayaka Yamasaki, who's 21 and 3. Mind you, that's dating back now three years. And I know she's not too old at only 26 years of age, but she's got 27 fights under her belt. So there is that wear and tear. Um, one KO TKO, six submissions, 13 decisions. And I would say that, like, against anybody else, she'd be a good grappler, but against Izawa, psh, Miles under as far as the technique and strength. There is uh, Izawa, one KO TKO, seven submissions, five decisions. She's the Deep Jewels champ, 5-0 and in deep and 7-0 and in Ryzen. And she won the belt against Claire Lopez in Ryzen. And then uh, won the deep belt against Si Woon Park. So I, I am going with <laughs> the obvious pick here. I am going with Izawa. But I do have a question for you. Is she not still the champ in Ryzen? And, and if so, why isn't this a title fight? Because it's uh, Kana Azakura's reti retirement belt. Oh, so there's no need for a title fight. Yeah, that's that's why it's a non-title belt. And that's why the odds makers have it so lopsided because Kana Azakura has been talking about retirement. And you know the old saying about, you know, when you're talking about retirement, have one foot out you are retired already. Yeah. So they're, I mean, they're, they're, that's what the odds makers are thinking. That's why it's so... You know, so lopsided because, like you're saying, Kana Azakura is not some like just scrub fighter. She's a good fighter that has good skills, good grappling. Every, but I mean, just Siki is always on another level. And you know, and she, and she's not retired. She's not retiring anytime soon. So this is gonna be. It's, it's, that, that's why the odds makers are like that because it's it's pretty much a showcase fight. They're giving uh, uh, Kana Azakura this fight uh, because it, it is her retirement bout. So they want to give her a good send off, and what better send off than the actual champion? And, and like you're saying, Aisha, she Izawa is the best Adamway in the world right now. There, it just, I mean, she's in the prime. She is prime time right now. Like I said, 26. She's a, a, just a sensational athlete. Uh, her grappling is next level, and her striking is getting better all the t every single fight. So it's like she, she's gonna be tough to beat. You know, they're they're gonna have to go into you know, if they want to find someone to be, they're going to have to go deep into the international pool. Probably have to go up a weight class. Probably have to get a straw weight to drop Dude, down to, to eventually get her. They're going to send her to Invicta next, and she's going to destroy all the all the girls in North America. <laughs> something uh, exactly. something exactly. Uh, Oshima couldn't do. Uh, what I will say, and again, in her early 20s, and again, Asakura is so active and had so many fights in her early 20s that even though she's 26, again, 27 fights, like, she's had a great career, and she beat your girl Reyna twice. One to Oh, win. don't remind me. Don't One remind me. Oh, first, my God. That first, was... First time to win the Grand Prix and in the rematch at Ryzen 11 as well. So like she, like I said, she's no slouch. She has amazing wins on her resume, but just hasn't been winning in the last couple of years. And like I said, one foot out the door, hasn't fought in over a year. And uh, yeah, at least she's getting a big name to go out on. And bro, like if she, imagine, like what a way to go out. Like if she not only wins the fight, she beats one of the best atom weights in the world, serves Izawa her first loss, and is the huge underdog win. That would be a crazy way to cap off her career, and it's definitely a possibility, but I don't think it's going to happen. Right, exactly. 100% agreed. 100% agreed. All right, and then we have uh, the intermission. Not of this show, but uh, on the Ryzen show. <laughs> 
Which uh, there should be stuff happening on the intermission. Can we talk about what possibly might be happening on the intermission? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know what you think is going to happen on the intermission. Or what announcements? We have a little bit of insider info about there, there's going to be at least, well, supposedly, there's going to be three bout fight announcements for the, there's going to be a card in November. And one the, the, uh, the our, our source did not disclose the exact bout, but he gave us hints of what it was going to be. So he said it's going to be a Japanese fighter versus an international fighter. And it's going to be, a, they're both going to be names. So it's going to be a nice big name bout, international bout that's headlining the, the November card. And possibly, like I like we were saying earlier, could they announce anything for the New Year's Eve event, the New Year's Eve collaboration mega event? Or are they going to wait for the uh, PFL, uh, the October, the big pay per view? In October with, with Engano and Ferreira, right? Could that be where they announce the New Year's Eve collaboration mega event? So it, it's, we're going to get some announcements, but we're anticipating just three bouts for the November card. But I'm hoping that we also get some hints for the New Year's Eve card. And because remember last time for Super Ryzen 3, they brought Chihiro Suzuki out and he was in the middle of the ring talking, calling out uh, Patricio Pound Pound Pipple and hey, I want that fight. Make it happen for the New Year's Eve event. Let's put all the belts on the line. Bellator belt, Ryzen belt, all that good stuff. Bro, he was also beefing with Kleber and yes. uh, and Ren. <laughs> yeah, he, dude, Chihiro wanted all the smoke that night. He I was ready it. to take them all on. God, I love it. I, I love Chihiro. Did your source or did you hear through the through your connections any more uh, hints on any BKFC fights, any bare knuckle fights uh, that'll be announced on any upcoming cards? No, no, but there is going to be, because remember, there that collaboration is going strong. And oh, yeah. it was a success on Super Ryzen 3 with the women's fight and with the John Dodson fight. Exactly. So there probably will be, but there the source did not... The only other information he disclosed is that the, um, the fight... That's that's going to be an international fight between a Japanese fighter, and international fighter, and it's going to be at featherweight. He said, "So, okay. so uh, you know that's and that's one of the premier weight classes in Ryzen. So, we'll we'll see who it's going to be. But there was no other uh, tidbits dropped about any bare knuckle fights or anything. But I would not rule that out because, like you're saying, I should." It was, you know, a smashing success at Super Ryzen 3. And that collaboration is going very strong. There's also another collaboration we got to talk about, too. The KSW collaboration. That could be another one. that Because, remember, they're supposed to be having a collaboration about at the start of December. I, I think it was – remember the, the CEO of KSW tweeted out, saying that it's going to be on December 12th or somewhere around there. And we're guessing they're going to send over guys like Kleber. And because, you know, he was a former KSW fighter as well. So they, and there's plenty of great matchups for Kleber there. And, you know, so that, that's, that's what we're thinking. And also the Azerbaijani fighters that were having legal problems, right? That, you know, if, if you know, like say Kurimov, what if he, if he, he had a, a felony conviction, right? That he just got over. They won't allow him back in Japan. Well, I mean, Felony Bennett was allowed to fight in Japan. Right. But... Somehow. I, I mean, I don't know. That, but they're saying that they won't allow Kuruma back in. I don't know if they can get a waiver or what. But, you know, for what, whatever it is, that's he's a prime candidate to be on this collaboration of KSW is what I'm trying to say. Because of his recent legal troubles and then probably, you know, giving him shit about trying to get back into Japan. And I, I don't know if he's going to get the Felony Bennett pass. So if he doesn't, he's another prime candidate to be on the KSW collaboration card. That's going to be hopefully happening the first, uh, you know, the first week of December, December you know 12th. I, you know what I want to, and I don't think we're going to get it on this one, but maybe we get it in the announcements on New Year's as we bring in the new year. I want Ryzen to officially, officially start beefing up their beefcake heavyweight division with some of these deep guys. And I want Phil DeFree before he retires to challenge whoever the top heavyweight is in Ryzen, which he's probably going to walk through and become double champ and solidify himself as the greatest heavyweight outside of the UFC right now, because he is dude. Phil DeFree is the greatest heavyweight outside the UFC right now. And I am until Francis Ngannou takes a step into the smart cage. Phil DeFree is the greatest heavyweight outside the UFC right now. Now, he's getting up there in age, and he's, you know, he's starting to slow down a little bit. I mean, 
Sakai almost beat him in his last fight. And if you're getting beat by Sakai, you know, that's not the greatest thing. But man, like, he's on one of the craziest runs, not only just for a heavyweight, but for any fighter right now. He's 25 and 6, right? But dude, in KSW right now, he's on, well, just his win streak right now, what is this? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 13 fight win streak, 12 in KSW, 11 title defenses. Man, man, I, I know you've been high on Phil DeFries for a long time. I can love Phil DeFries. When they announced the KSW collaboration, remember they had a Polish fighter that fought in a Polish heavyweight that fought in Ryzen, and that was probably that could possibly have been for Phil DeFries next heavyweight tile defense could that be what's going to be part of the ksw collaboration in december could it be him going over to ksw representing ryzen and being phil defries tile defense or could phil defries come over to ryzen we don't know yet I just, so want, just, I just want them to put like just because they don't have a heavyweight belt right now i want them to make a heavyweight belt times two size of you know not not quite one championship size because that's thing way too big <laughs> A times two size of uh, of their smaller belts. Just bring up a ton of these deep heavyweights who, you know, some are good, some are prospects, some aren't, but who cares? It's heavyweight, dude. We just, you just want to see entertaining fights. Start putting more heavyweight fights on and bring over some of these Polish guys. Don't drug test them and just start actually having more heavyweight fights and, be, and beef up that division. It's, I mean, Pride FC, the mighty Pride was was the heavyweight division let let's let let's 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 bring it back let's bring it back with that collaboration with poland absolutely not only the heavyweight division but the 205 pound light heavyweight division which of course almighty pride fc called their middleweight division but whatever it was the 205 pound with guys like Wanderlei silva shogun hua and then their heavyweight division was Rampage like actually well. was saying, yeah, Rampage Jackson, exactly. But their heavyweight division was the premier heavyweight division back in the day, the golden era of heavyweight. I mean, we're talking about the, the, the greatest of all time, Fedor Emelianenko, Big Nog, Big Noguera. I mean, Josh Barnett, Mirko Krokop, Mark Hunt, all these guys in their prime, in prime FC. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. They definitely need to bring that back. They definitely need to start shoring up these heavier divisions. I mean, I, I do like their WEC vibe right now where they're just focused on the lighter weight divisions and making those as stacked as can be. But, I mean, hey, actually, you're 100% correct. It's time. It's time to bring a heavyweight belt to Ryzen, man. We're, we're, almost fi we're almost 50 shows in. It's about time. Yes, and with all these collaborations that are happening with BKFC, with KSW, with PFL, PFL Tour, and Bellator. I mean, it yeah, is... Bring some of those fat f***s over. <laughs> yeah, and also, also remember, the UFC lawsuit is coming to a head in October. What could the landscape of mixed martial arts look like after that? What could that be? Could it, be, you know, could they make the contracts less restrictive? Could they be freeing up guys sooner? Also, remember, Bellator is supposed to be dissolved next year and folded completely into the PFL. There's going to be some heavyweights who need uh, who need some contracts. Exactly. There's going to be some. It's going to be a massive. I'm anticipating the the biggest free agency period in the history of mixed martial arts next year, 2025. I think it's going to be so massive. To, I, I'm I'm ready to get my pitch deck to, uh, together and go see uh, some venture capitalists and pitch them a, a a new promotion here. Let's let's get let's get going here, man. This let's is go. 2025 is going to be the year, bro. I cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. So yeah. I hope. Like you're saying, I hope they, they bring in some heavyweights. It's it's never been a better time than now. Now, now is the time. Exactly like you're saying, Aisha. Well, like Lee Su, that, that K1 kickboxer out of China who's already started to dabble in MMA as well. I mean, he's not going to be kickboxing forever. Ryzen, exactly. nab him up before the UFC gets him. Ex yes, before the UFC poaches him. That, that's, I mean, like we're talking about Doubtbeck on this card. I mean, Temurov was just two fights in. I mean, th this Ryzen is a big stage. And has look at all the fighters that have come from Ryzen that are in the UFC top 10 right now. I mean, obviously the big name is Jerry Prohaska, right? That's the big one. There's other guys, though. Manel Cape, or Cop, uh, Kai Kara France, uh, uh, Jerry Rosenstruck. Um, um, I mean, all these guys, th those are originally from Ryzen, and they just post the most recent one, Temurov. 
a fantastic flyweight that we were hoping to be in the flyweight Grand Prix. But, I mean, look at all these guys they're bringing in on this card here with Zulu. And, and I mean, just – so it's like I can understand why they let him poach the, that. But, that's, dude, Ryzen is a big stage – and they, the UFC is – if the mainstream media, the UFC media shills are not paying attention to Ryzen, you best believe that UFC is because they're signing guys left. Kaya Zakura, Temurov, and this is – there's – look, it, it, it's, it's more than just Jerry Prohaska. Let's just put it that way. So, I mean, it, it's, it's – and dude, if the if the UFC had an atom weight division, the floodgates would be open for Japanese female fighters, right? Oh, yeah. the, for sure they'd have Izawa, they'd have oh, yeah. Reina, of course, the, the, the superstar in Jap Japan. So just, uh, I'm actually glad that uh, the UFC does not have atom weight, so we get all these fantastic fighters. Stay I was gonna say, Japan. and so Reina could actually flying stomp people. Exactly. Yes. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. I think I, uh, I think it was at Ryzen 34. I keep telling your audience about how Reyna has the most beautiful flying stomp technique that we've seen since Shogun Hua. And I believe I looked. I gotta look it up again. I, I'm forgetting it, but I think it was Ryzen 34 that she did that flying stomp technique at. So I'll, I should. I'll, I'll send you a picture. Uh, I, I have the screenshots of it. So uh, it's just it, yeah, the next show that we do. That you you have that picture for reference to bring up when it's time we talk about it. I'll be hanging it. I'll be hanging it on my wall. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right, we got four. We got four more fights to get to. So let's oh yeah, let's get to them. So we covered the intermission. It's gonna be supposedly there are gonna be three fight announcements with one main fight for the November card being an international fight between a Japanese name and an international name at featherweight. That's what our sources are telling us. Related to us from Drew at the We Are Rising podcast. So, and, and so that's a good source right there. Just and that's all the hints that we could get. We couldn't get the actual names out of him of who was going to fight because he didn't want to give up his source. But you know that's that's pretty good information. Featherweight, big name fight, one of the premier divisions, international fighter, everything. It's going to be awesome. And hoping what you say is going to happen too. I ship. Talk about some collaboration news with your BKFC or KSW, possibly Phil to freeze. I mean that would just be fantastic. And then hopefully we get some New Year's Eve collaboration news, but I think they're going to wait for the PFL pay per view with Engano for that one. But we'll see, we'll see. So, but yeah, let's get to the rest of these fights here. Oh, and and they're going to have a concert for the intermission oh, as well. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. What? What is this? Eyes are by John. Anyways, yeah. remember that show that was there? Yeah. Wild. Anyways. Uh, Juan Archuleta versus Razabali Shadulayev. Now, this was one of the last fights, if not the last fight, if I'm not mistaken, to be added to the card. And two really big names. Again, we've seen this up and down this card. Young gun, up and comer, killer up and comer out of Kyrgyzstan against a very good veteran who is still very active. And though he's on a two-fight losing streak right now, Juan Archuleta is still pretty top of his game and he's no longer a bellator fighter he's exclusively signed by ryzen three and two in his last five fights but just some background one of those was when he was sick and he was having weight cutting issues and he ended up making weight an hour not not before the show started but an hour before his walkout against kaya sakura only to get need in the gut and um, lose in that one and then he lost to kleber via submission no shame in that kleber literally submits everybody so no shame in his last two fights he is getting up there in age 37 years of age but he will he's still the only mma fighter to have defeated patchy mix and he's had an amazing career like I said, 29 wins looking for his 30th. He's a pretty decent boxer uh, with 11 KO TKOs. He's only been knocked out twice. Um, one submission and 17 decisions. He grinds out finishes. He's a very, very strong athlete, a very good wrestler who, like I said, has some good pocket boxing and some good leg kicks as well. Nine and three in Bellator, two and two in Ryzen, and zero and one in the, the old World Series of Fighting before it became the PFL. And he was Ryzen champ. Mind you, it was short-lived, but he did beat Ogi Kubo for the belt. And he had three fights to earn that 
um, to earn that title shot, beating Inoue, who's fighting for the title on the top or on this on this card as well in the co-main event, and Su Chu Kim, who's also fighting for the title against Inoue uh, um, on this card as well. Both very good opponents. Now, I will say, for me, there's an asterisk next to the Su Chu Kim fight. I personally think that Kim won that fight, but again, it was a close split decision. That just shows how good uh, Kim is. And winning the title in Bellator against Patchy Mix is huge. Now, he did lose it to Sergio Pettis after that, but still, man. And the only guys that he's lost to, Kaya Sakura, Kleber, Sergio Pettis, Rufion Stotz, and Patricio Pitbull. Like, those are high-level names, man. Those are, those are some of the best that Bellator and Ryzen uh, can respectively offer. Now, on the other side of the equation... Holy shit, this 23-year-old is an absolute wrecking ball. A very good grappler as well. A amazing wrestler in his own right. Way more explosive than Juan Archilla has ever been in his career, in my opinion, in Shadulayev, who is 10-0 as a pro. Two KOTKOs, eight submissions, undefeated, like I said. Fought in ACA, which is a tough league. 1-0 in Ryzen. And what a debut in Ryzen as well, getting a quick rear naked choke against Koji Takeda, who is a wrestler, who is a grappler. So the fact that he was able to take Takeda out so quickly just, like, rose my eyebrows. I was like, oh my god, okay, this kid is for real. He's so strong for how small he is. And honestly, he was not crushing cans on the way up. And he fought in some damn good promotions. He beat a 12-1 and guy in the second round via Rene Kachok in UAE Warriors. Beat a 5-0 and guy in Road FC. Beat a 6-3 and guy in ACA Young Eagles. I mean, man, this guy's taken out some really good opponents in some awesome promotions. And he also won an amateur belt at Gamma. G-A-M-M-A uh, -A -A as well. He's only gone to decision once, and that was as an amateur, when he fought a 7-0 amateur in his debut. Who are you picking in this one, and what's your take on it? Man, I absolutely love this fight. Also, we gotta show, throw the caveat in there that this fight is also gonna be aired free on YouTube. An unprecedented... Usually, they only air the first two fights free, right? And opening ceremony. But this time, they're doing the, taking an unprecedented step to where after the intermission, they're airing this fight specifically for free on YouTube for everybody. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're obviously going to be watching on the pay-per-view, so we're going to get it no matter what. But anybody else that, that's not, you know, order the pay-per-view, they're going to get to see this fight for free on YouTube. And there's a reason for that. Because Shadalaya is one of the top, like, the hottest prospect, one of their biggest signings that they've had, in, in, I mean, in, in a while. They're so high on this kid. And for good reason, exactly like you were saying, Aisha, fantastic resume, find some big time promotions up against great opponents and has shown that he is a great fighter. I'm actually hoping that Juan Archuleta can beat him here because I don't want him poached by the UFC. I'm scared the UFC is going to poach this kid. That's how good he is. I, I, I'm literally scared. That not if he beats Mark Letta, not till after the Grand Prix. Exactly. He said that's what I wanted him to do with Timurov. I wanted him to lock him up and get get the Grand Prix going, so you have them locked up for at least three fights and a showdown with Kyoji Horiguchi, uh, hopefully, so before they can get they can be poached by the UFC. I mean, this is this guy really is arguably the top signing of, of Ryzen recently. I mean, even more so than Dalbeck, and and just. I, that's why I'm hoping. I mean, honestly, it goes. Beyond, I always root for my American fighters, but I, it goes beyond that this time because I'm hoping that if Juan is able to beat him, that that will make Shot Alive unpoachable to the UFC. So that's that's how high I'm on this. I, I think he's going to be a future title contender. I think I think this I believe is an unofficial uh, title eliminator right here. Mm. I believe if Shot Alive can beat Juan Archuleta, especially if he finishes him. Uh, 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 just a tough veteran like Washington. like you were saying, Aisha. Even though he's coming off of two losses, those were against high competition, and he's the only man to beat Patchy Mix. Uh, he's, he's a good fighter. Yeah, I think he's still top five. When they before they got rid of the Bellator rankings, he was top five. I think he was number three ranked Bellator right before his most recent loss. So he was, you know, he's a great fighter. Washington is a great fighter, former champion, all that. This is definitely the toughest test of Sean Alive's career. But if Shadow Lab can pass this test with Flanker, I, I believe he's next for the title shot. 
I really do. I think this is an unofficial title eliminator. They they might even announce that, that that's why they're that's why they're airing it free on YouTube. Mm. They might even announce at the fight, hey, if you win this, maybe if he wins, they might even say after the fight, hey, you're getting the you're fighting for the title next. Or the winner of whoever fights the you know the main event, they might even bring him out to a face off. Who knows? We'll we'll see how the fight plays out. But you know, we've got we gotta see how the fight plays out first. But I could also those are all possibilities of what could happen. And, and I want to ask you, what are the odds maker? What are the odds look like for this bout right here? I know it was the the most recent bout added, but have they dropped the odds yet for this one? Yeah, and it, it's close, man. So Betway has it uh, minus one seventy five. Shadalayev plus one thirty. Juan Archuleta. So close wow. in that one. And then on Bet Online, a little bit more of a gap in Shadalayev being minus two forty and Juan Archuleta being plus one ninety. But still wow. relatively close, especially for Ryzen, you know, betting odds. Absolutely. And, and that's, uh, man, this whole card, like you're saying, this whole oh, card, geez, except for Izawa. Yeah, man, that's that's incredible. Uh, you know, Iwana is, is, he is a legitimate live, another, this is another live dog fight, a live underdog bet fight, because Juan Archuleta is a great fighter. So, and this is the toughest test of Shot Alive's career. I just happen to think that Shot Alive is that guy, and he's going to pass the flying colors. But we, hey, we could be wrong. We could be wrong, and, and that's why they're matching them up. And, and it just – so Juan's another live dog here. This, this is incredible. I, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. I did not realize that the odds were that close. So that, 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 that's, that's incredible to hear. So that, that's, that, that, that just takes this fight to a whole other level. I'm really excited for this one. This one is uh, – dude, I might even more anticipated for this fight than for even the title fights just because of how high profile it is, how they're – they're taking the unprecedented step of airing it free on YouTube. That's for a reason. They they anticipate this fight's going to be an absolute banger, and they want the international fans to see it. That's oh, yeah. why it's featured Juan Archuleta, former Bellator fighter, everything. That's I mean that's and it's featuring their their one arguably their hottest prospect signing. Uh, you know, a recent memory of in Shot Alive here. Man, it's this is dude. This is a banger on paper. And I, I feel confident and guaranteeing it's going to be a banger in practice, and it's going to bring the fireworks. So I'm really looking forward to this fight. So who's your official pick? I, you know what? I, obviously, my official pick is obviously Shad Elayev, but I, I don't want to rule out Juan Archuleta. I want people to know, especially with the odds being that close, he is a live underdog bet here. This whole card, except for two fights, like you're saying, is a bunch of live underdog bets. Man, this. For, for the betters out there, this is going to be a really fun card right here. I mean, e even more so than, I, I guess, because that adds to the fun. Do you bet? I, I don't I don't bet. Not, ever, not but. really. I don't want it. I don't I don't ever want it to ruin my fandom of the sport. That's why I stay off of it. Yeah. Because then you have too much. You have too much invested in it. Exactly. I, I'm the same way. But for those betters out there, I know there, there's, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun for them. This card has so many live underdog bets. It, it's 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 fantastic. It, it's a it's a better's paradise on this one here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm with you as well. I think Juan Archuleta is a great underdog for this one, especially at plus 130. But uh, I just, man, Shadow Live is grappling. It's just the style of it. Because like Juan's a very good wrestler and a good grappler as well. But Shadow Live is so explosive. And he's so strong for how fast he is. Obviously way younger. Actually has some decent striking as well, despite... His explosive grappling and wrestling being his bread and butter. Obviously, Juan Archuleta has way more experience fighting top guys, former champion. But like I mentioned in my breakdown in the intro, like Shadu Live has fought some damn good opponents in his last few fights as well. And, and honestly, throughout his entire pro career. I mean, ACA is a great league. I mean, ACA is probably, you know, they're, they're probably upset they couldn't lock him up after he had his run on uh, Young Eagles there and that Ryzen was able to get them. And Juan has decent power as well. He's knocked out, he's knocked out his fair share of opponents and he's good at getting TKOs in the dominant positions on the ground as well. And Shadulayev, his gas tank hasn't been tested at the pro level yet. He has never been to the third round in his 10 pro fights. He's finished most of his fights in the first round and a handful in the second. So what if Juan, because Juan likes to go to decision, 17 decision uh, victories. So we'll see. And, and Ryzen fights can be won in the third round. 
because of the scoring system, right? So I'm very interested, to, and especially with how explosive he is, I'm very interested to see how good his gas tank is if this goes past the second round. So that is something to note as well. If his cardio is good, though, I mean, I, I imagine that Shadi Live is going to win this one. But Juan Archuleta, not a bad underdog pick. I do think this one... Oh, I do think it goes the distance. I don't think Juan will let... Shadow Live rear naked choke him, and I don't think Shadow Live is going for some freaking heel hook or something crazy that Kleber is going to throw that Kleber threw up, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but hey, but you know, Juan Archulet is he does have the momentum coming off two losses. So, and Shadow Live is coming off sensational victories, finished victories. So, he's got all the momentum as well. That's got to factor in a little bit too. So, I, I mean, I, this is great, but Juan is a tough, durable fighter. So, this you're you're probably right, Aisha. This probably is going to go to decision, and it's going to be interesting to see what Shot Elias' gas tank is going to be like in that third round. And you're absolutely right. The, the rising superior rule set scores the fight as a whole. I mean, every it's not round by round; it's the fight, the entire fight as a whole. So if even if you lost the first two rounds, if you make a comeback in the third round, and and, and you know. Let's we'll use the term that most fans can understand. Like, if you 10 8 that person in the third round, right? Dominate the third round, yeah. If, if you dominate the third round, if the safe shot of live gases and Juan's able to come back and dominate that third Do round, a lot of damage, yeah. Yeah, th throw some ground at knees, throw some great, good style looking fights. I mean, style looking strikes, the superior rule set stuff. So he could pull off the victory with the, with the third, strong third round. You're absolutely correct. So it, it's going to be real interesting to see how this fight plays out. And I, I mean, I just can't wait to see it. I'm so happy it's going to be free on YouTube for international fans to see. I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm anticipating it's going to be fireworks, and I really think it's going to deliver. I know we've said that in the past, you know, and then the fight is kind of, you know, I, I just don't see that. Uh, there's a reason why they're putting it for free on YouTube because pace, I believe it's going to deliver. The pace is going to be next level. Yeah, yeah, both these guys, and also uh, the walkouts. Remember. Juan Archuleta has shown in the past he he does he fully embraces the pageantry of the Japanese mixed martial arts, the Epic Rising Fighting Federation, and he's he might have a fantastic walkout as well. So it, it's I, I, I anticipate that he will because that's another reason why it's going to be free on YouTube because maybe he's going to go all out for the walkout. So it's going to be the full package here. I, I mean, I, I just can't wait. This is uh, like I was saying. This is arguably I'm arguably more excited and hyped for this fight than some than the main events. But I don't know. No, I don't want to say that because the main event is pretty is yeah. is a banger and a we half. Say but. This. More excited for that one than the featured fight in another. Like, I'm just gonna say the last three fights are very close in odds as well. Uh, Shinibu Ota against Yuki Motoya. Now I. I don't think the momentum will dip too much in this one because this one could be a high paced fight as well, but it is going to be back to back grappling heavy fights. I mean, Shadow Live and, and Juan might duke it out. I highly doubt it. That's going to be a high paced grappling affair. And honestly, this one's probably going to be that as well. If Yuki Motoya decides to be like, all right, Mr. Wrestler, let's let's see what you got. I can also wrestle. I, I just, you know, I lost I lost a boxing fight to Vince Morales, which, by the way, big shout out to Vince Morales, re-signed to the UFC after an incredible regional run upon getting cut and an awesome win against Yuki Motoya earlier this year. Yuki Motoya came back strong and deep against, you know, a layup fight, a, a, a tune-up fight, as Rampage Jackson says, um, with a guy in deep four months ago. But Yuki Motoya is good, man. 35 years of age, 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Um, he may not be an Olympic Japanese wrestler, but he's a very accomplished MMA fighter. 8 KO TKOs, 13 submissions, 14 decisions, and he's only been knocked out three times and has only been submitted three times as well. 10-7-1 and one in Ryzen. 25 and 4 in deep. This guy's the king of deep, man. This guy's the king of deep. 25 wins in that promotion. That is amazing. Um, and he has gone on incredible win streaks in both Rise or well, in Ryzen and in Deep. Um, most notably between 2021 and 2023, where he earned a title shot, actually beating Shinobu Ota in that run. So this is a rematch. Um, where he beat Shinobu Ota in 
2022 when Shinobu Ota was only two and one. But anyways, in that win streak, he did earn a shot against Kai Asakura, lost against Kai Asakura, came back strong against a 20 and 18 guy in deep who he knocked out in the second round and then fought Vince Morales where Vince Morales did not give up the takedown, kept the fight on the feet, and basically outboxed him for three rounds. It was an incredible fight, by the way. Uh, an incredible performance by Vince Morales. But Motoya, very well-rounded, a better grappler and submission artist than a striker, but he does have way better boxing than Shinobu Ota. And he's already beat Shinobu Ota. He already knows the path to victory. It's not like Shinobu, Shinobu Ota's wrestling has gotten any better. His hands have gotten a little bit better. His ground and pound and his MMA skills have gotten a little bit better. But is that enough to beat Motoya? Maybe since Motoya's a little bit older, but it's not like Ota's beaten that great opponents. Yeah, he went over to Bellator two months ago and absolutely ragdolled some freaking croissant uh, baker, some baguette baker who is five and five. <laughs> who the fuck is this guy? Nobody knows. Yeah, okay. Obviously, he was going to ragdoll him and su and submit him. Freaking north-south choke too. Imagine getting north-south choked coming right from the bakery. To a Bellator cage. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. But anyways, uh, he did beat Ushiku, which is a great win. And and honestly, I would I would say that that was his best win in my opinion because before then, Ryzen gave him a, a layup in Ashizawa in MMA. Now Ashizawa had had in my opinion against Koji, fight of the year in in all combat sports on Super Ryzen three. That was one of the best stand up wars I have ever seen in mixed martial arts. He has no ground game. And Shinobu Ota finished him twice in the same fight because Shinobu Ota choked him out. The ref didn't see that Ashizawa went to sleep. Ashizawa wakes up and then Ota elbow KOs him right after in that modified half guard. So like poor Ashizawa in that one. But again, Ota was almost at risk of going under 500. And Ryzen couldn't allow their Japanese star Olympic wrestler to go under 500. So they gave him Ashizawa, um, then gave him a test in Ushiku. He passed that test, and then he went over to Bellator and, like I said, got a, got a layup against a guy who had no business being there. So, like, Ota's wrestling, incredible. No one can deny that. I just haven't seen him put together the other elements just yet against high-level competition consistently. So I'm actually leaning Motoyo on this one, man. Really? Wow. Yeah, I am. Wow. I, you know, I'm, I'm actually on the opposite. I think I, I think that there, this could be a, a potential um, unofficial title eliminator as well. I think they're, they're really high on Ota. He, he's an Olympic silver medalist. He, he's, he's not, I mean, he made the podium. He's not just an Olympic wrestler. He's a, he's a medalist. In, in, in a, he's an Olympic medalist. So a silver medalist. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, he's, he's got excellent, excellent wrestling here. And, you know, he has shown great improvement, and they're really high on him. And, I, I, and he was thrown into the fire really early. I mean, you, you were talking about how he fight, faced Matoya when he was only 2-1. and one. So, I mean, they're, they're really fast-tracking this guy to, you know, and they, they want – and, and I, I just believe if he beats Matoya here and get that win back, he's going to be in, the, in a title shot, in a title picture in the next fight or two, 100%. Because he just – I mean, and he, in his recent fights, he has shown great improvement. Like you were saying, the the elbow TKO of, of Ashizawa, he showed great striking, showed he knows the assignment with ground and knees and stuff. I mean, I mean I, 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 Ashizawa was like half dead though, so I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and also that Bellator win, that was a Bellator W, Bellator big stage W. So, and that was you know he that was in Japan, that was in the Bellator cage overseas for Ota. So he that was a road win for him as well. And, well so, yeah, I mean, he beat Kuramoto and he's beaten uh and he's beaten Sone as well. Like he does have good wins on his resume. It just for me it just hasn't been consistent. And when I watch his fights, it's just like I I wanna see call me selfish. I wanna see the striking developed a little bit more. That's all. Well that's that's what they're that's what they're making this fight right here. They're putting up against a guy that beat him when he was just, you know, green around the just just you know, a green fighter just getting into the sport. So now they're rematching them to see what has Ota learned. How has how far has he progressed? Has he grown enough to where he can beat Matoya? And I believe if he does, they're gonna fast track him to a title shot. Cause like I was saying, 
uh, you know, the Japanese, they love their Olympic wrestlers. That's that's one of their best events in the just this most recent Olympics in Paris. They had they had the most Olympic medalists in the wrestling department of any country. Wow. Do you know that? So it's like they they really enjoy their their Olympic wrestlers and Ota is like I said a silver medalist and I I, I just I can't and that he's coming off a big win over Ushku former champion so that's that's that was the biggest win of his career and then now they're matching up with a guy to get a, a win back it's it's I'm telling you I believe it's an unofficial title eliminator and if Ota prevails here. Look for him to be in a title picture sooner rather than later, and and I'm hoping he does it in sensational fashion. I'm picking. I'm actually going against you on this pick. I'm curious. What do the odds makers say? I'm picking so, Ota to win here, but do they have him as an underdog or a favorite here? So this is. So I just want to preface it by saying I've definitely highlighted and acknowledged the good underdogs on the card that the betters will probably have a keen eye on. But this is the first underdog pick of mine on the card as Motoya is plus 160 wow. on Bet Online, plus 150 on Betway, and Ota's minus 200 on both. Wow, interesting. So they, like even the betters have Ota. You're going with the favorite on this one. Yes. Oh, wow, interesting. But hey, Motoya is a li another live dog. This whole card, bro, except for two fights. That, I think that's, that's the theme of this event right here. Live underdog bets for everybody i mean this is this is incredible motoya is no slouch like you're saying he has a win over ota before i'm surprised that the the betters uh, made him uh the book the odds makers made him a minus 200 i would think it'd be lower than that like minus 100 so that's that's incredible to hear that motoya is a, a, a but he's a live dog this is another live dog bet right here for motoya because i mean you know, do, we don't know if Ota has progressed enough to beat Matoya. Matoya is still a fantastic fighter, right? Who's beaten, you know, great competition, and he's coming off some. So, uh, is he coming off a win? I can't remember right now. Matoya is coming off a win at deep, yeah, but not against the best guy. But I would say a better guy than that Frenchie that Ota beat. <laughs> Okay, so at least he still has some momentum. You know, he's not coming off a loss, right? So it's it's, it's not the momentum is not a factor in this. They're both coming off wins, so I mean, it's just it, look. It's all going to come down to how much has Ota progressed. If he has progressed enough to beat Matoya, it's going to be great, and I, I can't wait to see if that happens. But hey, Matoya is a live underdog bet here. I'm picking Ota to win. I'm picking the favorite. But Matoya is a live underdog. Another one. Another live dog bet right here. So, man, another great fight. That's why it's on the main card. Oh, this, yeah. this, this. That's why it's the featured fight. Yeah, exactly. And, and I believe it's going to be a, a potential, unofficial, no, a number one contender title eliminator bout. So, I, I believe if Ota can win this, I believe he's going to be in the title picture very soon after this bout. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, Matoya... I just think is more well-rounded, has more striking tools, and is also dangerous on the ground in the submission aspect, though, not necessarily the, the mauling pressure ground and pound that Ota has definitely improved on the ground. Less of a mauler lay in prey and, and more of just like a menace all around on the ground now and actually has some good submissions and some good superior rule set action with his knees as well. Um, Motoy is the former deep champion, and I just think in his... His last two losses were to way more high-level guys than um, than uh, Ota as well. And he's good at striking. He's good at stuffing takedowns. Now, is he good at stuffing Olympic wrestler takedowns? Well, we shall see. Um, but I like his jiu-jitsu. I like his scrambles off his back. And if if he can keep this on the feet, I do think he'll piece Ota up. I'm interested to see if he throws leg kicks early because I think that'll be key. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And will Ota check them? Has Ota shored up his striking to where he he can handle stuff like that, like leg kicks or or you know the the little bit better striking that Matoya possesses? Will Ota have progressed far enough to where he's going to be checking those, not eating yeah. leg kicks? Right. So well, it's yeah. going to be really interesting to see. And superior rule set, the superior rule set, 
doesn't favor wrestlers as much as it favors everybody else because you can't have those Dagestanis grabbing ankles uh, like in the UFC because you might have a kick coming right to you. Exactly. Face. Exactly. You can't you can't be leg humping in the superior rule set. If you shoot for sloppy takedowns, you're gonna eat knees to the face and grounded kicks to the face. Absolutely. And if you try to flop on your back and pull guard, you're gonna be eating stomps and possibly hopefully flying stomps, Shogun Hua style. That's what we want to see the, the, arguably the most exciting strike in the sport of mixed martial arts is a flying stomp so you're absolutely right Aisha and I'm, I'm so glad that you talk about on your live streams whenever and the pussified UFC rule set whenever it, the opportunity you, you're just on it right away I just love hearing that that's keep doing that don't pay attention to the haters that, that's oh. what needs that will help the legalization effort I mean I, I bet you anything because that, that's that's why 12 to 6 elbows are going to be legalized in November. They've already been legalized, but they're going to be implemented in November in the UFC, right? Well, and the adjusted knees, too. The adjusted knee strikes as well. Right. Yeah, they, they, they adjusted the ground, the quote-unquote grounded fighter rule to yeah. where now you can't just have a hand down. It's got to be like a forearm or a knee or whatever, right? Yeah, you got to be grounded. You can't just have your freaking finger on the ground there. Evloev Arnold Allen style. It's progressing. The, the, the first domino has fallen. The first domino was legalizing 12 to 6 elbows. One championship for all the shit we give them and Shatri, you know, it, it, dude, they got grounded knees legalized in two american states right now and for the epic rising there is a like we were saying in the intro uh, or the first fight the uh, synopsis when you were talking about what we call it, grounded kicks instead of soccer kicks now there is a legalization effort underway and it could be coming sooner than we think so it's just i mean it's it's an exciting really exciting time and and look at what happened well, did you see what don davis and pfl said about elbows Everybody yes. was was you know hounding him about hey we need to add elbows to PFL and, and even the fighters were getting on the mic after their fights and saying oh you know like like the Bellator fight, um the most recent one uh, Sumika Ina uh, um so the Lady Samurai Sumika Inaba I think is her name and she got on the mic saying oh my last fight was in PFL now I'm in Bellator where I can use elbows again and was praising elbows and so that that was the most recent example of fighters talking it up. And I believe that pressure has gotten to where Don Davis is saying, hey, we'll see what happens next year. So maybe even PFL could be implementing elbows as well. And what if, what if, since the UFC now allows 12 to 6 elbows, what if that includes PFL allowing 12 to 6 elbows now as well? Um, hey, it's, that's, it's a real possibility. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. So it's like, and I hope that really, I really hope that happens. And you know, I, I'm going to get on it right away, but I think we should also, Flood, flood Don Davis's Twitter, especially after they announced the 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 New Year's Eve collaboration mega event with the Epic Rising. We got to flood his Twitter and say, "Hey, Don, you got to go all the way, brother. You got to go full back. You got to allow the superior full rule superior set. rule set for the New Year's Eve collaboration mega event." But, anyways, I, dude, I I could go on about this for hours, Aisha. You know me, I I love it. So, but I just want to point out that you know this is, dude, the dominoes have started. Four to six elbows. We could be getting it sooner rather than later. So, I mean, and the superior, like we're talking about bringing it back to the Ota fight. You can't be shooting sloppy takedowns on a superior rule set. You shoot, you, you spam takedowns. You're going to be eating knees in the face and grounded kicks. That's what we love about the superior rule set. So just want to put, grab a bow around on this whole little rant we're going on here, but to bring it back to the Ota fight. But yeah, I just can't wait to see what happens in the Ota fight. Honestly, it, it's, it's a banger. That's why it's on the main card. It's, it's it's a banger. Speaking of bangers, we have two title fights at the end of this card here, starting with the vacant bantamweight belt since Kaya Sakura vacated it to come over to the UFC and hopefully get a title shot right away against Pantoja, given how the flyweight division in the UFC is kind of in shambles right now, given that there's just no clear title contender. That could be Kaya Sakura. That's a conversation for another day. We have Naoki Inoue against So Chul Kim. And my goodness, this one should be amazing. Inoue, 17 and 4 as a pro. 3 and 2 in his last five fights. He did win his last fight against Shoko Sato. Now, couldn't finish him, but put up a very good uh, performance against a veteran of the game and a guy who's very hard to finish. 
And overall, he's fought some great opponents. Now, it's awesome that he actually trains in North America quite a bit. Sarah Longo product has actually fought in the UFC before. One KOTKO, nine submission, seven decision, seven and two in Ryzen. But yeah, one and one in the UFC where he's fought some good opponents. Um, lost a, recently has only lost to Juan Archuleta and Ogi Kubo. I mean, two really good names. In the UFC, he lost to Matt Schnell, who recently retired, but Matt Schnell was, he was always a gamer. Always a gamer, and he narrowly lost to Matt Schnell um, via split decision. And he's also fought in Cage Fury FC, which is cool as well before fighting once in deep and then basically becoming a full-time Ryzen fighter. He's got really good submissions. He's got some superior rule set uh, finishes in a grounded kick back in 2021. And he's just a very well-rounded fighter. He just doesn't have that straight punching power. Like, I don't want to say that he's not strong because he is and he's and he's wicked skilled and he's more of a flashy um, and scrambly submission artist where he can get in these kind of wacky positions um from the ground or actually can get really good takedowns and pull guard and actually be dangerous he can still walk you down and also employ his jab employ combos but he doesn't hurt guys enough to knock them out on the other side of the equation su chil kim Honestly, one of my favorite active Korean fighters right now. Still only 32 years of age. 22-7-1. And, and I think a little bit more of a deserving title contender here, given that he's on a four-fight win streak. He's 4-1 and one in his last five fights. Eight KO TKO, six submissions, eight decisions, incredibly well-rounded, and he's never been knocked out before. Yeah, he's been submitted three times, but he's also... Landed six submissions. Two and three in one championship. He is the former uh, one championship uh, title holder. Lost to Bibiano Fernandez. No shame in that. Bibiano Fernandez, one of the greatest one championship fighters of all time. Sucks that they did him dirty also on the way out. But again, we don't got time to bitch about Shotri there. But did, did hold the title in one back in the day. Uh, also won the Road FC title. And he's a two-time Road F, or he he defended the Road FC title um, as well. He lost it to Hajin Park and then won it back. He lost it via guillotine choke and then won it back with a head kick. So I mean, a little bit more of a dominant victory there, in my opinion. And beat uh, Ogi Kubo in his Ryzen debut. Lost to Juan Archuleta, but in my opinion, dude, he beat Juan Archuleta. I think he did more damage. I think he was more dominant. That one was a little sus in my opinion, but, you know, close enough fight where, again, it's not 10-point must system, so third round, but Archuleta did a little bit more, and I think he was able to squeeze it out there. But then went on a four-fight win streak in Road FC, uh, three fights in Road FC, two in Ryzen, and he finished all of those ones. Sorry, four-fight win streak where he finished three out of those four wins. He went to a decision against a very good 19-3 and three fighter. Um, submission, ground and pound, and straight knockout in his three victories by finish in that one. 3-0 and in Ryzen. Like I said, 2-3 and in one championship. 0-1 and in Bellator, but should have been 1-0 and in Bellator. Um... This is for, this is for the vacant belt man and he's the favorite coming in at this one in this one as well minus 175 and minus 160 respectively and I have Su Chul Kim to win. He and I'm not being biased cuz I just really enjoy this fighter. I have him to win because I think he's more well-rounded. Sure, maybe his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, maybe his uh offensive grappling and submission grappling isn't as flashy, but I think he's way stronger than Inoue. I think he's way more of a power puncher. I think he's way more of a power wrestler. I think he's just more of a stronger fighter overall. He's hard to finish. Two-time champion already outside of Ryzen in really good promotions. His striking is, I don't want to say as like polished in the boxing but his jabs are good. He can fight at range. And when he gets close to you, he hits way harder. Um, like I said, Inoue is also a solid striker. But I think Sucho Kim actually is a sneaky good submission artist. Utilizing his strength to get to those dominant positions. 
Um, a little less technique, but that's not to say that his technique's not good either. I just think he's too much for it in a way. I think his footwork's better, I think his power is better, and I think he has the strength advantage as well. So I'm going with him as the favorite and new out of Korea. Nice. Nice. I mean, that's and that's very interesting that the odds makers had them both at minus 100. Shows you how close this fight is. It's a pick them. And what, what great matchmaking. This whole card, fantastic matchmaking. It's just, just incredible. And you know, I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna go with uh, Suo Chul Kim as well. Uh, he's, he's been a long, like like you're saying, probably the, arguably the best Korean fighter going right now. You know, outside of the UFC, obviously, and just I mean, like you're saying, former one champion champ, and he, he's, he's he's the current road FC champ, right? That's where Mansar Barnawi is from, you know, and and just and like you were saying, the Juan Archuleta bout that was very close, and I bet you if Suo Chul Kim had had a little bit more striking in that second round, like it thrown, you know, like like I I thought he, if he would have thrown some ground at knees, I bet you they would have given that decision. That's how close it was. Yeah. If he would have just thrown a little bit more flashy strikes, the superior rule set strikes, especially in that second round, it wouldn't have mattered what Juan did in the third round. I think Suicho Kim would have got it, and, and it, that's how close that fight was. So it was a very very close fight with Juan Archuleta. It, or, or, we also might add this was a couple years ago when Juan Arceta was still in the middle of his prime, still a top three, you know, you know, uh, coming out Bellator championship and all this stuff. Very, very top fighter. So just no shame in that loss. Close decision loss for Suo Chul Kim. So I'm I'm very high on him as well. I, I agree with you, Aisha. You know, fantastic, fantastic uh, synopsis assessment of this fight. Both these guys. That, that's why the oddsmakers have it so close. Both these guys are excellent fighters. Either one could win here, but I'm going to give the slight edge to Suo Chul Kim, even though he's the older fighter here. Even not though, in much, a way, though. Has he's, UFC he's, experience, like you said. I said, he's not that much older though. He's 32, and in a way, is 27. So he's not that much older, but definitely has fought a lot more. Yes, yes. So it's it's but. That's, again, that's why it's such a close with the odds makers. They know how close this fight is. That's why it's for the title, you know. And, and it's just, it's, it's going to be great. This might even eclipse the main event that we'll talk about next. But I'm, I'm really excited for this. I'm hoping Sul Chul Kim can pull it off. I, I'm, I'm, but my heart is picking Sul Chul Kim, and even I even want my head to pick Sul Chul Kim as well. That's, I'm just, I agree with you 100, percent Aisha. Yeah. I, I think he's just a, the slightly better fighter here. And I think he's going to get it done. So we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's going to be a great fight either way. Absolutely. And we've made it two hours in. We've made it to the main event. For oh, the geez, it's been two hours? I haven't even realized. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to take that long, guys. It just, I just, I enjoy this so much, Aisha. Thank you for having me on again. And thank you for letting me talk and, and rant and stuff. It just, it's so much fun. I didn't even realize it was two hours. It hasn't even felt like, it's, it's felt like 20 minutes. It's been so fun. This this might not surprise you, Jay Wolf, but every time we do these, we go two hours. <laughs> <laughs> when when you love something, you can talk about it at length and for for hours. So it's 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 just it's that enjoyable for us. This dude, these shows make the fights even more fun for me, oh, especially me talking to you and, and and hearing the odds and hearing your breakdowns of these fights. It just enhances. The fights for me, I was already highly anticipating this card, but since doing this show, I had no idea that this card, the theme of this card was the live underdog card, right? So it just, that just makes it even that much more better for me. I, I don't even bet on the fights and it makes it that much more better for me. It's just, I just can't think, you know, this has been so much fun. I, I'm sad we're at the end already, but it, what in this main event is going to be sensational. It's just, I mean, this is what we've been asking for. We've been asking for Gustavo to get a title shot. For so long, and he's finally getting it right. So I, I, yes. I can't wait to hear your breakdown of this fight. And that is it. I like you guys at the We Are Rising podcast, as well as myself, have just been screaming for him to get a title shot because it's so well deserved. Fourteen and two as a pro for Luis Gustavo going up against the champion Roberto Satoshi da Souza, and Luis Gustavo man is a very good competitor. An awesome competitor here. We got Brazil versus Brazil. Now I know Satoshi is one of them 
half Brazilian, half Japanese. But but it's still crazy to see that we have a Brazil versus Brazil for the Ryzen lightweight title, even though Satoshi is basically an honorary Japanese fighter at this point. But Gustavo, 14-2 and two as a pro, 4-1 and one in his last five fights. And what a run he's been on, not only in his entire career, but in his last few fights as well. Seven KOTKOs. Five submissions and only two decisions. That's what we love to see, man. And that's what the Japanese people love to see as well. He's only been knocked out once. And he's uh, only other lost via decision once. Which I think is something to note. He's never been submitted. He's never been submitted. And he's going up against a submission artist. But... He's no joke on the ground as well with five submissions to his name. Six and two in Ryzen, three and zero oh in Katana fight. His last win, he beat uh, Hori, who's thirteen and four as a pro. He beat Takeda, who's fifteen and four as a pro. He beat uh, Ohara, who's thirty one seventeen and two again. Older fighter, but he knocked his ass out in the first round. And he also beat uh, Yachi, who's 23-12 and 12 going into that one. And he was able to take him out in the second round. His only two losses were to a prime Patriki Pitbull and Miku Asakura. Both of them still buzzing on win streaks in their own right as well. And that's it. And he lost to Miku unanimous decision. He got... He had to, he got grounded, kicked in the face by Pitbull. But hey, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> um, but still, those are the only two guys in his entire career that he's lost to, and he's been facing solid guys throughout his entire career. When he was six and zero, he went up against a six and zero guy. When he was seven and zero, he went up against a six and two guy. Um, when he was five and zero, he went up against a nine and five guy. Like as soon as he got to that five pro fight threshold, like I mentioned early in the show, he only took fights against really good opponents and i love his style he's kind of a crazy brawler the way that he just like rushes forward and and just throws those shots even though his striking isn't like insanely polished it's way better than satoshi in my opinion and sometimes he even welcomes the takedown to almost deceive you like if i can't knock you out and i throw a swinging overhand and you double leg me i am incredible off my back as well and i can land some submissions now I don't think that's the best game plan here against Satoshi, but he's one of those rare guys who's going up against uh, D'Souza who's not necessarily that afraid to go to the ground, which I think is very interesting. Now, Roberto Satoshi, we know his game plan. Just like Kleber, he is an amazing uh, submission artist. He's an Abu Dhabi ADCC guy. Uh, 16 and three as a pro, three and two in his last five fights, and a very impressive win against Nakamura, who he TKO'd on the feet. Nakamura's corner threw in the towel or whatever that yellow pole was that is kind of a towel in Ryzen. I don't know what that was they threw in there, but it was yeah, yeah. But that, that was basically waving the white flag, all right, the yellow flag up in this motherfucker. But anyways, that was a surprising victory because I thought Nak I, I thought um. Uh, Nakamura would get the better of him on the feet, but uh, Satoshi, looking like he spent a little time in ACA and um, and KSW, if you get my drift, given his frame. <laughs> but but hey, I'll give it to him. He looked incredible on the feet in that fight, which was awesome to see. So I mean, that tells me that maybe he stands and bangs with Gustavo for a little bit before, you know. Okay, taking it to the ground, taking taking it to the ground. If he doesn't get the better of him on the feet, before then he did lose to Patricky Pitbull via KO TKO due to leg strikes. So it's not like he's inhuman, right? Like he's remember that was on a less than a week notice. Remember he stepped up to save the Bellator lightweight Grand Prix because AJ McKee had got staff infection. Remember that is true. That is true stepped up the same week like it was literally less i think it was less than five i think it was four days notice that he stepped up on, on to fight Patri hey. a prime patriki pitbull and, and hey <laughs> props to him for stepping up and you know props to uh, patriki for that game plan to just going after his legs but like i said if he's if he's on that rushing gas or whatever the hell they load up their fighters there with in ksw that shouldn't have been uh an issue. I'm just, I'm just kidding. By the way, he just looked absolutely massive in the last fight, and I was like, hey, if there's anyone Ryzen's gonna just like, we're, we're just gonna turn a blind eye to it's their star in, uh, in Satoshi. Now, I'm not Dude, suggesting that turn he's a blind eye to everybody, bro. Uf, the freaking UFC has dumped Usada. Every single UFC fighter is on the juice. Everybody's on steroids, like Nick Diaz was saying. Okay, Usada is gone. 
they are all juicing now. There is nobody should give a shit about ped testing or drug testing anymore, except for the IQ tests on Fight Night, right? This this is I mean this is ridiculous that Japan and and Glory and all these other promotions are so hung up about steroids now. When the UFC doesn't care anymore, the UFC dumped USADA. US eighty eight is gone. I will say this. What is other than Rise and what is the most exciting promotion out there in MMA for finishes? KSW. Look at the KSW fighters. Enough said. Enough said, dude. Yeah, uh, Pudzilla, Puzanowski. Come and, on, dude, even the women, dude. They got tra- they got traps twice my size, and they're just absolutely swinging and banging, knocking each other out left, right, and center. And that's why we. That's dude. For me, my three favorite promotions in this order are Ryzen, KSW, then the UFC. Because KSW puts on exciting fights. But anyways, like I said, we've gone over two hours. We can't go down this rabbit hole, but we will we will on the next one. <laughs> yes, we can. This is, this is awesome. Hey, if, Rogan gets, if Joe Rogan gets three hours, we can get three hours, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Satoshi has five KOTKOs, ten submissions, one decision, and he's never been submitted either. So neither of these guys have ever been submitted. Nine and one in Ryzen, zero and two in Bellator. And again, putting his title up, on the line here against Luis Gustavo. Now, the AJ McKee fight was close. I do think AJ McKee was more active. He was doing a little bit more damage. He was controlling and actively just trying to land more, trying to stomp, trying to kick the body there, and just didn't accept the grappling match. And when he did, he was able to get into dominant positions. Now, was he in deep water at some points? Yes. But anyways, three uh, really good title fights before... Satoshi was in before this one too against Johnny Case, Yachi, and Tofik Musaev, which was a huge one. He's got some great wins on his resume as well. A lot of the same wins though, like he lost to Johnny Case in 2019, was able to beat him defending the title in 2022. Beat uh, Yachi in 2020, beat him again two years after for the title. So this is fresh blood. This is fresh blood, and he's a dangerous, dangerous fighter. And I'm not going to lie, as good as Satoshi is on the ground, he's not, in my opinion, like the boogeyman threat that, like, Kleber is. I think he's more human on the ground than Kleber, who's just, like, dude, he's just so fucking nasty on the ground. It's, it's insane. Satoshi is a little bit of a different frame, though. Not super lanky. He's a little bit more beefy. Man, I... This is the second underdog that I'm picking to win. And new baby, I'm picking Luis Gustavo to win this one. <laughs> uh, yes. I, and the odds are close, man. The odds are, are close. They? Excellent. Gustavo's a plus 175. Roberto de wow. Souza Satoshi is a minus 250. Wow, dude. Another, dude, the, the theme of this card, Ryzen 48, is live underdog bets. This is incredible. Gustavo is absolutely a live underdog bet. I mean, this this is incredible. I can't believe how how close all the odds are and how many un, great underdog bets there are on this card. I mean, what a fantastic breakdown he just gave right there. I should this, and you're right. So, uh, Satoshi De Souza. I mean, th- that fight with AJ McKee. Some people had uh, Satoshi winning that. I didn't. I, I thought, like you were saying. AJ McKee threw stomps. He threw the first grounded kick. Uh, it was on Showtime, right? That was on the Bellator versus Ryzen thing. The first grounded kick and flying stomp attempts on Showtime ever in history was by AJ McKee in that bout right there. But the people that were saying that Satoshi De Souza won that fight is because, like you were saying, he put AJ McKee in. De- he had submission attempts that were on deep that some people count as quote near finishes. That's why they were saying that uh, Satoshi arguably won that bout. But I, I thought that, no, AJ McKee's more flashy striking. That definitely won the bout with the damage, all that good stuff. But it was a close decision. And AJ McKee, as we know, is one of the best fighters, uh, especially now. I mean, the kid is incredible. So, I mean, uh, he's probably going to the UFC sooner rather than later. So, because, I mean, the, the PFL doesn't even have his weight class yet, right? So... I'm I'm thinking he's probably going to be in the UFC, and he, you're going to see him just run rough shot over the UFC fighters, and probably get a title shot sooner or you know later. What, and you know what I hope? I hope that because 
not that the UFC have snubbed him before, but like there have been opportunities for him to go to the UFC. He's been loyal to Scott uh, Croker. He's been loyal to the Bellator brand. He has no loyalty to the UFC. If Ryzen can pay him enough, he's a guy who loves pageantry as well. I would rather see him go to Ryzen than the UFC, personally. 100%. Oh, I would love to have Pachi mix in the Epic Ryzen. They're, then they could do the rematch with Horaguchi, another close fight. That, you know, if, if Mix had to, that was where the back... McKee, McKee, sorry, McKee. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry. McKee, not Patchy Mixed. My bad. Oh, I, I got him mixed up. Uh, uh, that's, I'm no sorry. Pun, no pun intended. I know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm sorry about that. AJ McKee with Patricio Pound for Pound Pitbull, not Patchy Mix and Horaguchi, but... Dude, look, he, but anyways, there is so many good matchups for him there. It would be sensational for him to come to the Epic Rise. And he has fought in Ryzen before, right? Not just that uh, New Year's Eve collaboration mega event. He's fought in Ryzen before that, right? Yeah, well, even if he just continues to fight at 145 or 155 too, like, it, that'll be... They'll, they'll make room for him because he's a star and, he, and the Japanese love him. But um, how do you see this one going? Okay, okay. yeah, And, and one more point, like you were saying about the pageantry, he, he had that uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars actual, like, authentic samurai suit that he walked out in, right? So he fully embraces the full Japanese mixed martial arts scene. So just, I, I just want to agree with you 100% on him coming to Ryzen instead of UFC. But it, it's just, we're just saying how great of a fighter he is and how close that fight is was with Satoshi DeSouza and how great of a fighter Satoshi DeSouza is. And like you were saying, his most recent title defense earlier this year he showcased some striking we didn't even know he had. And he yeah. got a TKO victory that included some superior rule set. So that was literally this yeah. year. That was the only superior rule set finish this year. That it had some ground kicks in it. And that was Satoshi DeSouza, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu master, had a superior rule set finish for his title defense. So could we see some striking in this bout? I don't know. I, I, I highly doubt it because, like you were saying about Luis Gustavo, He's he's a wild. So you know why that is because he's a Wanderlei Silva protege. He fights like him, dude. He fights like him. That, that and that's why I wonder if Wanderlei Silva will even be in his corner this time. I think he has in the past before. I don't know if he'll be there this time, but that's 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 why he's like that because he's a Wanderlei Silva protege. And that, but if he look, if he wants, he's got to earn that title though. If he wants to be the next Wanderlei Silva. Dude, we got to see some superior rule sets. We got to see some stomps. We got to see some grounded kicks from him. We got to see some grounded knees from him. We got superior rule set action from him if he wants to be known as the next Wanderlei Silva, okay? Let's just get that out of the way right away. But this is his opportunity right here. This is opportunity to, to – he's fighting for the title. We've been calling for it for a long time. Like I laid out here, he's had some incredible competition and fights and just – Man, this is this is just a banger. I'm so happy to hear the odds makers are that close, and they have Gustavo as a dude, a total live underdog. This is incredible. I can't like you're saying, Aisha. He's no slouch on the ground either, and that we know that's what's going to be Satoshi's game plan because I seriously doubt Satoshi's going to want to strike with Gustavo. I think he did that in this previous fight more as a surprise to uh, wasn't it, uh, was it Kanahara that he, he did that too? I can't remember exactly Nakamura. right now. Nakamura, that's right. So he, I think he wanted to surprise Nakamura to to with the striking. That's exactly what he did. I don't think he's going to take the same game plan on this one. I think he's going to go to his bread and butter, which is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's one of the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu lighterweight fighters in the game today. So we're going to really see, does Gustavo have the, uh, the, the takedown defense to keep it on the feet? Otherwise, we're going to see. It's, it's going to be tested, your theory, Aisha, about that Gustavo has... The, he's not. He's no slouch on the ground as well. So we'll see if that how it happens. And it's real interesting. He's a lot. I mean, that he's a plus one hundred underdog. That is a live dog bet because if uh, Satoshi decides to keep it on the feet for however long he does, he's in danger. Gustavo, his nickname is Killer for a reason. He has some fantastic knockout lo uh, wins, you know, and only that one knockout loss to a prime Patricky Pitbull, which is by grounded kick, by the way, a superior rule set, the great equalizer here that we're talking about. So it's going to be, and, and he knows how to throw superior rule set strikes as well. So this could be, I mean, it could, it's a shame of the a real banger for the lightweight title. I'm really excited for it. My heart 
is picking Satoshi, and I want to say my head is picking Satoshi. I mean, it, uh, Gustavo, excuse me. I'm sorry. My heart is picking Gustavo, and I want to say my head is picking Gustavo as well, but I'm just going with I think that Sato Satoshi de Souza is just – I mean, I know you don't, you don't think he's as good as Clever, but they're in the same camp. They're, they're the reason each other are so good at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is because they train together, Clever and Satoshi. So I think Satoshi is just that good with his grappling. That And you remember how he got Tofik? Remember it was, it was with like some kind of like modified like jumping flying triangle thing that he got Tofik with, right? So he he is very creative as well, just like Clever is. That's how remember that's how Clever got Juan Archuleta was with a freaking create like just like gnarly like leg lock scissor like freaking uh, ankle out of nowhere, right? So I'm guessing it's amazing. It's amazing. But Tofik and Juan Archuleta, they ain't Brazilian. I don't know. I don't know if you know this, but Brazilians actually come out of the womb in a gi and a couple stripes on their white belt. So Gustavo, he ain't no uh, American. Okay. No, but sorry. Continue. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, that's a great point. But I, look, I just think it's, it's an odd thing to have it close for a reason. That's why it's so close. So I think it go either way. But I, but like I said, I just think Satoshi De Souza is going to have just a slight edge with his better grappling, and we're going to see if Gustavo. I mean, I would love nothing more than for you to be correct, Aisha, and Gustavo to have the grappling to hang with Satoshi, and then you know he prevents him from going to the ground, and you score the superior rule set not, uh, win to, to win the title. I think that would be the picture perfect ending for him, and then that sets up the rematch with uh, Patricky, right? Patricky now is. He, he's out of the PFL season, so he needs something to do, right? I bet you this is what I think is going to happen. I'm guessing is that the, the whoever loses this title bout here, the Rising title bout for the lightweight title, is going since they both were former Patriki Pitbull opponents. I think the loser is going to fight Patriki, and then the winner of that will get to fight uh, Gustavo, either Gustavo Satoshi for the for the the title after that. That's that's what I'm guessing would happen in the first quarter of next year. So it just there's so many implications for this fight. I just can't wait to see how it plays out. I mean, I'm I'm excited. I, mean, I just that's uh, makes me so happy to hear the odds makers are that close and that they actually have Gustavo as a another live underdog. What a fantastic card! And I, mean, I should, look, I don't I don't even want it to end. I'm having so much fun talking about Aisha, but we've come to the end here. This is this has been incredible and just. Man, what what a sensational card! I can't wait to watch it with you. And thank you for having me on again, brother. This has Always. just been so much fun. I, it's it's made my enjoyment of this card even more already, because like I said, we like I didn't know this was the theme was the live underdog bets on this card, you know, coming into this this show. So I, I just thought it was just banger after banger you know, with with great matchups, right? So it's just man, it's just I can't thank you enough and just. Man, it was so much fun. Thank you for having me on, and and just and thank you for doing media. For for I mean, look at how great this card is, bro. We got great amazing. And nobody else is freaking talking about it. Okay, we're we're really lucky if we give it a weigh-ins article from one of the quote unquote mainstream. Uh, I call them the UFC media. I don't even call them MMA media anymore. So it's just I just can't thank you enough. It's just been so fun, and just man, it just and dude, everybody make sure. The City Life Project. Like and subscribe right now. Aisha is one of the best out there doing it right now. This is incredible. And he, and also with his co-host on Mondays, the review shows. I absolutely love you guys' reviews. We're even talking about kickboxing and stuff with the Rush Hour podcast. Jay from the Rush Hour podcast for the Rush City podcast as well. Make sure you all tune into that as well. And then also for me, I'm going to be doing the Focus Fights podcast i also appear on the we are rising podcast sometimes as well check those out and, and and just it's just so much fun to talk with you guys about the epic rise and I, again i can't thank you enough this has been so fun and just man i are, are you gonna do a review show or no We'll definitely do a review show and i will be live streaming doing play-by-play -play and commentary on saturday night slash sunday morning for the Ryzen 48 epic card out of the Saitama Super Arena. So we'll have a lot of live coverage for this event. We will wrap it up on Monday. So don't forget to join us for that. The stream will be up uh, probably the next day after you're watching this uh, 
preview and review show and like jay wolf said smash that like button subscribe to the channel this is my favorite time of the week leading up to these rising cards every single time there's a big rising card we bring on the mighty jay wolf here the only other north american who loves this promotion as much or even more than me ladies and gentlemen i didn't even think that was possible before we wrap this up officially let the folks know where they can find you on social okay on i'm on twitter i still have my old uh, i haven't switched it up yet i'm still on my original name which is j a y y o l f one it's misspelled on purpose because that was what i was started commenting on the yahoo message boards way back in like 06 or 07 whichever year it was because there was a million other J Wolves, so I just said, forget it. Just put two Ys down there. It makes it easier to search, but I'm going to switch it uh, eventually to a, a regular spell. I figured out how I can use like an underscore so I can get like their uh, the actual right spelling. So I'll switch that eventually. But for right now, it's J A Y Y O F 1. That's on Twitter. If you follow me, I follow you right back, especially if you're a real person and not a bot. I will follow you right back. I love talking to people that are the mixed martial artist fans, just like myself, and especially about the Epic Rising. I, I won't be, you know, I won't be flooding your timeline with UFC stuff or anything. I'm strictly all about the Epic Rising and, and you know, stuff like King K One with the Eight Man One Night Grand Prix. That's what I love. You know what I mean? I love the Superior Rule Set. I love my One Night Grand Prix. That's my favorite thing about the combat sports, and also on the Ryzen Discord, the Ryzen FF Fans Discord channel. I absolutely love it in there. I'm a, I'm a mod there, and that's where we are. Drew from We Are Ryzen Podcast is there. That's where we get all the insider info from uh, about what the potential uh, announcements are going to be during this intermission. There's a bunch of guys that are in there. Uh, uh, Daniel Zubicki, our Polish uh, a friend from Poland, is in there. Um, uh, Todd Atkins, you know, from the MMA Conspiracy Hours in there. Uh, um, I already said Drew and them. Um, we got, oh, 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 um, CJ from, you know, with, you know CJ where he does uh, mm, yep. podcast with Shu Harata. He's in there as well. We got a bunch of big time guys in there that fr from this scene in there that it's, it's, just, it's so much fun. And it, I just highly recommend everybody join there. We do live, you know, we, we watch it live. And we talk about the fights live, and there's a lot of fun. So everybody join there. Also, you can find me on the uh, Focus Fights audio or Focus Fights. We're going to be doing a podcast with Jay Chris Gary, Jay Christian Gary. That's going to be happening um, as this recording is happening tomorrow night. As it's recording, this is recording Wednesday night, so it's going to be happening Thursday. But it'll be ready for you in time for the fights on Saturday. So make sure you check that out. And then, yeah, that's it. And then right here on the City Life Project, one of the best, if not the best podcasts around, for especially for, for fight odds and everything and betting. And, I mean, I hope you, I hope you do a review show, Aisha, and I can come on the review show with you. It's just, man, it's just, I just can't thank you enough, brother. It's just, it's just been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be on your show again. Thank you for having me on. And thank you for thinking about me every time the right Epic Rising comes to town. Because it's just, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite promotion, and I'm so happy that you love it too. And you know, and you're all about the superior rule set, and that you're. And thank you so much. Also, I want to make sure to emphasize this. Thank you for you know, for, you know, for helping with the legalization effort and calling them grounded kicks instead of soccer kicks. I just can't thank you enough. It's just. Man, it's awesome. Thanks, thanks, Aisha. I really appreciate hey, you, brother. Like I said, the pleasure is all mine. It's always an it's it's always a treat to bring you on the show and be able to yap with someone who loves this promotion as much as me, who loves real MMA superior rule set as much as me. And this isn't my show anymore, brother. This is our show. This is <laughs> our show. Thank leading you, up to the bro. Ryzen, leading up to all Ryzen events. So uh that's going to do it. We've gone a little bit long, but that's okay. Like I said, I needed my brother to to yap with about this amazing promotion and about this card. And if, so, if, if Joe Rogan gets three hours, we can get three hours. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Like and subscribe, guys. And I'll give the final words to the mighty J-Wolf. Pride never die. Pride is rising. And we out. Peace. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. Wake up. 
Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day.